Welcome to this special live stream of 132 Problems. I am here again with my friend Gary Arnell, who contacted me this week with a suggested topic that he thought would be useful to do as just a midweek, um, a midweek conversation. And I thought it sounded right on point of what we need. So, I'll, well, Gary, I'll let you go ahead and introduce your topic, and then we can talk a little bit about why it's so relevant right now. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks for having me back. I really appreciate it. Uh, basically, something that's been on my mind uh, as I've interacted online, and, and, and it seems to have escalated uh, in recent, even just weeks, um, the, the how we interact with one another um, the, on the different sides of, of this question is uh, not particularly Christ-like, <laughs> for lack, <laughs> lack perhaps of a, of a better word. And uh, that that's worrisome to me because uh, as we talked about in our last uh, conversation in episode 118, uh, if contention enters into the picture, um, I, I feel that the adversary has already won. And so how yeah. do we have difficult conversations? How do we disagree agreeably? And I think that the, the problem that we're seeing, and this is among, I think, you know, mostly God-fearing cr Christian people, very often members of the church, uh, temple recommend holding, you know, all, all of those things that we would normally feel a, a, a significant affinity towards, that we would um, have very similar beliefs, you know, a, a very, you know, we, our, our values DNA is, is very, very, like oh, near 100% as far as what we share, but you wouldn't know that by watching um, the, the comments that go back and forth either on, on social media. And that 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 worries me. And, and so I, I reached out to you and you kindly said, yeah, let's talk about it. So um, if you want to bring up the, the slide. Yeah, well, well, let's talk about it just a yeah. little bit more because yeah. I have found it to be so fascinating that I think for me, being a disciple of Jesus Christ primarily means you act the best you can as Jesus Christ teaches and exemplifies, right? So it's fascinating to me to have it instead become about sort of, do you believe the right things? And if you don't believe the right things, then I can treat you however I want to. And it doesn't matter at all because I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ because I believe the right things and you believe the right, the wrong things. That's yeah. shocking to me. I'm assuming that's part of what you're talking about. That's exactly and, what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been interesting because I have done several people. I, people have been like, how are you doing all this? And I don't know. I've been like needing to decompress because I've done several um, additional interviews and appearances on other channels right. this past week and a half or so. And and I um, I did that that discussion with Bill Real. And um, and after we were kind of talking and they asked me to be in the com in the um, chat when they when they streamed it live. And they all voiced concern about how people sort of in our camp would show up in the discussion. And that was so interesting to me that a, among a bunch of people who have left the church, there was concern about how the people in our camp would show up. And I really found myself hoping that we would show up in a really uplifting, productive way instead of in a contentious, demeaning way. And um, and that, I, well, for the most part, people from the other camp showed up. And I'll tell you, they were horrible horrible not i mean not all of them but a, a large portion of them were just horrible and it really sent me into a deep funk to recognize how difficult it is to just have respectful conversations you know and then and so i really hoped that gary could come on and help all of us do our best to to raise the bar and even when people are coming after us like i really do feel like right now for you know, all of these reasons that aren't don't take a rocket science scientist to figure out. I really am kind of like the number one punching bag from every side. It's crazy how much. I mean, we were talking about some of the other episodes that have been done and by ex cult leaders that have now joined Mormonism and, and you know and and reading through those comments, I just feel like please tell me this isn't who Mormons are. Please tell me this isn't the general makeup of my church because it's heartbreaking and people that are unwilling to engage, but so quick to accuse when the adversary is called the great accuser. So I hope I'm not stealing your thunder. I just, I wanted to kind of set the stage for why I was so excited when Gary <laughs> contacted me with this topic, because on the one hand, I do hope that our side can really be known for being respectful and smart and on point and, and having the best discourse possible. 
and letting the other sides do what they will. Like, like let's let's demonstrate how much we are trying to um, to follow the example of Jesus Christ and to seek truth without going to the ad hominems or the snarky things. And Gary, I, I spoke for a minute. Can I say one more thing? Of course, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the other thing that's been on my mind is this series I'm starting, um, kind of focused more specifically on Brian Hales. And I'll tell you, that's been hard for me, way out of my comfort zone. And I've talked to, well, well over a dozen people, like pretty much anyone I could think of who I'm like, okay, I value their opinion. Let me talk to them. I, I know I called Gary about it or at least messaged and yeah. several other people as well, because in general, I really do like to address ideas, not people. I certainly don't want to do an entire series directed at people. And yet for me, I just, it, I'll be releasing a video next week. The first one in my series that I'm, that's, that's really funny and fun and, but a little bit poking fun, which I'm super uncomfortable with, but I kept every time I would pray about it, I would have the answer. Yes. Yes. You need to do this. And, and I've had to work hard because it's like, ah, oh, that's not me. I don't like, I don't like that. Like I really am nice. You know what I mean? And it feels not nice in a way. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of, I, as I've thought about it over these weeks and had just the confirming, you know, so in a way, this is a terrible example, but it's the one that comes to mind, almost like Nephi being told to slay Laban. And he's like, but that's not me. That's not who I am. Do you know what I mean? And, and what the Lord has kind of shown me is like, this is the narrative that needs to be taken down. And this is the person promoting the narrative and also trying to get anybody kicked out that doesn't abide the narrative that he sets and that he promotes. And then not that it matters because I don't like the quid pro quo, but he certainly has gone directly after several people that are in, you know, Whitney Horning and um, Rob Fotheringham and um, Denver Snuffer. He did a video just about them. He's done videos about me. So it's both. in So it's kind of like, okay, well, I'm going to do it. But I wanted everyone to know that I'm very well aware that this isn't necessarily my brand or my style or my comfort zone to to respond to someone directly. But these are the reasons I'm doing it. And um, and so anyway, so at, we'll see. We'll see what happens. The Lord kind of let me know as I was praying about it this week. So I was like, am I doing this wrong? I really don't want to make a mistake. And and the answer, well, I had several different answers. But one of them was just this awareness that it's kind of part of my a big part of my hesitation has been that I'm really afraid of the consequences. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to do something that, anyway, like, but as soon as, as soon as the Lord helped me see that, I was like, oh, okay. If, if I'm afraid of the consequences, I can deal with that. If it's just my own fear rather than I'm doing it wrong and I'm not getting the, um, the insights correctly. So anyway, I guess I wanted to bring that up because as we're having this conversation about how to do this agreeably, I feel a little bit like, Am I doing it right? You know, because that's been the question I've had. So so I wanted to lay that out there of why I'm approaching it this way. I feel like going after the ideas is not enough right now. We have to go after the person spreading the ideas in mm. order to really have the impact that I feel like we need to have. So that there's that. And now, yeah, you can respond and then go ahead with your presentation. Oh, thank you. I, you know, kind of the image that comes to my mind um, when we disagree disagreeably is something like rearranging the, the, the deck chairs on the, on the Titanic while it's sinking, that the, that the, the bickering and the animosity that we see in our in online conversation, whether it be on this topic or on some other topic, is indicative of a much deeper problem that our society, not, not just we in the church, not just about polygamy, not just about church history, but as a society, as a culture, what we're seeing is, is a reflection of something mu a, a much deeper problem that actually threatens, mm -hmm. in my in my opinion, it threatens civilization. It threatens our way of life, and um, and and to see it among Christians, to see it among those who have DNC one twenty one, you know, written on their hearts, where they're supposed to, you know, long suffering and persuasion and kindness and you know, love and faith. It's like where's where where are, you know those, those things have just been jettisoned, you know, and it's like why is that? And so that's. That's what I'd like to talk about is let's t let's go to the 30,000 foot view and see why why is this so bad? You know, we talked we talked in the last 27 minutes of our last conversation about uh, the what are we what are we sabotaging when we 
go about things wrong. And, and we talked about that in, in a little bit there. And that's where that's this is almost a continuation of the last 27 minutes of, of, of our last video. That when we when we disagree disagreeably, which includes disagreeing poorly, like bad evidence, fallacy, attacking the person, I think that we are literally breaking the social contract that binds our society, our community, our relationships. Um, whenever we're engaging in, you know, whenever we're engaging in, in conversation, we are, we're, we're, we're like, like we talked last time where we're breaking the threads. We are fracturing. We're strengthening or weakening. We're, we we're doing one or the other. One or the other. There's really no middle ground. Um, we, we, we're fracturing, rupturing, slicing the threads of the social fabric, or we're repairing them. Mm -hmm. And you know the, the basic and idea. Let me, is, yeah, go let ahead. me add. I don't think you're wrong to say it's it's it is a societal threat, a civil, like a existential threat for our society because we have the model for that in the Book of Mormon, where they broke into their tribes because they lost the ability to have a coherent society, and they yeah. did call that a great tragedy. That like yeah. they yeah. lost the ability to have a culture where they could abide one another in their differences. Yeah, I, I actually cite that later on in the presentation. Oh, I'm sorry, Kate. No, you're good. It's, you're, you're exactly it. right, because it's Helaman 6 through, I think, 3 Nephi 7, and it's exactly what happens. Like, this was put in the Book of Mormon for a reason, that they lost yeah. their government, you know? First it was corrupted, then they lost it, and they separated into tribes. And that's that's the direction, that's the that's the vector that I see when I see this kind of, 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 of discourse happening online. The the And just to kind of give people the big, big picture of what we'll be talking about today, um, historically, power or might makes right has been the default modus operandi, the, the way that, you know, in human relations, what we have in the West, ideally, now we fall far short. You, you talked about that last time. We fall short of the ideal. But we should be aiming for the ideal. The West places truth and merit higher than power. Merit is simply a, like a synonym, a, a synonym for truth. It identifies someone who's capable of performing well according to actual, real, true circumstances. But a merit, a, a society based on truth or merit, is contingent upon our collective or aggregated good behavior, pursuing and employing truth properly, um, which means we have to treat truth sacredly. I, I've even got, you know, oh, say what is truth? The, the lyrics there that's like, read that, you know, how precious truth is. Um, so there's there's pitfalls to watch out for. But there's principles that can give us hope and guide us. And when we talked last time about how I, I, my feeling is that our education is severely lacking, this is one of the ways in which our, severe, our, our education is severely lacking. We don't, we, we're trained for professions, we're trained for consumerism, we're trained for inter, to, to be entertained, to consume. We're not trained for citizenship, we're not trained for discussion and conversation. And it shows like really, yeah. really, really badly. So if you don't mind bringing up the slide. Good. Yeah, let's get into it. Let's see here. So um, what we'll do is we'll talk about the problem. We'll talk about power versus truth. We'll talk about the the Western social contract, which I didn't really learn about until grad school. It's like, why wasn't that part of my education? Um, and then we'll get into um, the good news, the bad news, what, what's hard, but what's what's the, what's hopeful. And then how do we engage online? That's basically what we'll cover. So the problem, um, I think that uh, Thomas Sowell Genius, genius. If you guys, if, I love Thomas Sowell. Oh, he's amazing. So he said, mm -hmm. and I think he just sums up the problem, you know, perfectly. He said, one of the most pathetic and dangerous signs of our times is the growing number of individuals and groups who believe that no one can possibly disagree with them for any honest reason. And that is like, that's like, ta da, we could end right now. That, that, that is the problem. That's that it. We, that's mm -hmm. it right there. Um, and that, and we see that in the polygamy debate. You know, it's like we are, you know, we are so similar on so many things, and yet if you are different at all, and this, I thought it was just between denominations, and now with this question, it's no, it's within my own, my own religion, my, within my own people that I'm seeing this, and these are all actual quotes that people have hurled either at me or at you or at somebody else. Like this is what you get called when you have a disagreement, and oh, that's that's that is a problem, you know. And I, I, it is, like I said, it, it is a, it's a, um, it's an, it's an example. It's a symptom of what's happening in our larger society. So if you go search Google for just five seconds, you'll find that the, the problems with social discourse, the breakdown in social discourse is being talked about a lot. It's like, what is going yeah. on? Why are we not able to talk to each other? And not just the breakdown in social discourse, but 
could this lead to a second civil war in the United States, for example? And that's, you know, it's like people are thinking like that. You know, it's in the New York Times. It's in Time Magazine. It's in, it's in major publications. People are talking about, it's like, can we live together? Why can't, you know, we can't even talk to each other because it's either words or it's, it's either the pen or it's the sword. That's, that's history, right? Either it's mm -hmm. power and coercion and force, or you discuss. If you stop discussing, what you're doing is you're inviting, you're, in, you're, you're heading towards, you're turning your face towards, even if you're not walking yet, you're turning your face towards the use of force to make things happen. Because you're saying you're not even worth talking to. Don't give them air. Um, you know, that, that's, yeah. this is where that leads. And can I, can I add to that last slide yeah. really yeah. quickly? Because I think that there can be, when, when I know that at times when I've been really Id idealistic, the breaking into tribes sounded like maybe that'd be a good thing, you know, like when I was much younger. And sometimes it feels like, I know there are people that want revolution, but what I hope that people can recognize, I, I think of Benjamin Franklin with, if we don't hang together, we will surely hang apart. We have a lot of enemies abroad. And if America continues to destroy the social fabric, it won't be Americans fighting Americans. It will be outside forces taking advantage of the fact that America is so divided that it's become completely weak. So there are much bigger threats um, to face in this world. And there are much bigger dangers than just our not being able to get along with one another. I believe a lot of this is being intentionally sown in our society, right? And, and so that's why it is so essential. Do I want truth or do I want to, do I already know I have all truth and I just want to win? And I find maybe yeah. this polygamy, date, polygamy debate is a good sort of practice area for us to take this into the broader realm on all of these more national yes. topics. Yes. I think it should be a wake up call. I think it should be a wake up call mm -hmm. to members like, because in the church, so in society we disagree all the time and often quite nastily, right? But in the church we rarely disagree. If if but if we're honest, church is more about feeling than it is about thinking. It's not a scholarly endeavor like we talked about last time. It's 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 focused on discipleship, on our individual action. The assumption is already that we already have the truth. We just need to apply it, and the wrestle is internal, not external. We don't get into real. We we don't experience. I I don't experience differences of opinion in church. You know, in the how many decades I've been attending, that's not what I find there. It's I receive and I then think internally, how do I pro how do I apply this? Um, yeah. But with this, with the, the polygamy debate, we are seeing the exact same kind of nastiness that we see, we see outside of, of the church, like when discussing something like pol politics or something like that. Um, when and when we when we disagree disagreeably, we invite contention, we invite anger, we invite frustration, we invite gloom, we invite pessimism, we invite othering of you know of our fellow humans, our fellow members. We invite tribalism, which goes to what you were talking about with Elam and Six or, or and beyond, um, which are precursors to the disintegration of some level of relationship, whether it's familial or social, societal, an award. You know, can, can you imagine if if this got thrown into a ward? You know, it's like a little bomb. Oh yeah. It would just, you know, and I, fortunately that hasn't happened in and, my world, but I could see it happening. And all of these things are truly antithetical to the spirit of God. That's why they're so destructive. It's like, as soon as contention and all of the other things you've named enter in, the spirit can't be there at the same time. And so that's why, you know, the savior wants us to be one. And if we're not one, we're not mine. You're not mine, he says. But that doesn't mean I'll agree. That it can't, it doesn't mean you all have to think the same way. It means that yeah. we don't other people as we are trying to come to truth through discourse, which is how it's done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's there's a great business book. Uh, Patrick Lencioni is a is a great uh business organization management uh guru. And he wrote a book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And the the lowest the he says, in order to have, in order to achieve results, which is the highest function, the first thing is you have to trust. You have to trust the people on your team that they've got your back, that they value you as a human, that they're not trying to backstab you, they're not trying to maneuver around you. And then the next level is that you have to be able to have healthy conflict. And you're not going to have healthy conflict if you don't trust. You know, you're not going to say the uncomfortable thing if you think that they're going to use that to maneuver around you, to move sure. over you, etc. So. Um, it's, it's, it's that same idea, you know, at the societal level, if, if you don't trust the per that the person you're conversing with, um, values you as a human, if, if, if their first reaction is to other, it's, oh, it's game over. It's, it's, it's already game over for the conversation. At that point, it becomes a battle of words. Tribalism ensues. Right. 
etc. And that's true of all relationships, marriages, oh. parent-child relationships. Like, like that's just how it is. It, like, yeah. I think those principles are universal to good relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you can so, keep going. I won't. Oh, sorry. So, so the, the, the real is it's like it's worse than I thought. You know, I I thought that. Um, kind of, Kind of like I mentioned last time, I thought my religion is a safe place, you know, as far as, you know, we are all one, we are unified, you know, and it's like, oh my gosh, this, it doesn't take much actually to, to go in the other direction. So, so what do For we sure. do about this? And this is where we go to the 30,000 foot view where, you know, historic, oh, well, actually, let's, uh, before we go there, let's compare Tom, what Thomas Sowell said to what a couple of members of the founding said, because they, they had a different, they had a particular mindset about how do we get away from this? You know, power has always been the dynamic that ruled everything. How do we get away from that? And this is the attitude of uh, Marquis, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette. He said, I read, I study, I examine, I listen, I reflect. And out of all of this, I try to form an idea into which I put as much common sense as I can. I shall not speak much, I shall not speak much, for fear of saying foolish things. I will risk still less for fear of doing them. For I I am not disposed to abuse the confidence which they have deigned to show me. Such is the conduct which until now I have followed and will continue to follow. So he's like, I'm going to be super, super, super. I'm going to, I'm going to read, study, I'm going to listen way more than I speak. I'm going to say this, this great care of how I act in society, how I behave, how I speak, what I say to others really, really matters. I'm going to be very, very careful about it. I don't, you know, how often do we see that kind of care? Uh, Jefferson said something very similar. I, I never considered a difference of opinion in politics and religion and philosophy as a cause for withdrawing from a friend. Now, he said that when he and Adams withdrew, you know, so it's, it's like even with those ideals, you know, that it was, it's still super, super hard. And he and Adams, who had been great friends, like split, you know, for like decades. And it wasn't until their final years that they kind of reconciled. So even those who like, they knew it, but it's so hard. And we'll talk about, you know, the, mm -hmm. how, you know that, that difficult. And, oh, you're going to go back to the story because I think like their reasons for splitting after what they had experienced in some of the, you know, like that, that time was tough as tight, as tough as we think our time is. Theirs was, you know, we haven't gotten to that point yet that they had yeah. lived through and experienced. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 th I I don't know how healthy of an appreciation we have for how hard it is to maintain a society based on truth, which which is based on individual sovereignty versus one that's based on who's the most powerful guy that we all have to watch control. out for and control. It is it is so hard, and we don't talk about it. We don't we don't really learn about it. We just talk about there's three you know there's three branches of government, and there's a right. vote. You know, there used to be a bill first, and then it goes. You know, it's like. No, we need to talk about how the difficulty of citizenship, the difficulty of, of yeah, of being a free person. So, so that we can appreciate the responsibility we have, how yes. much we each yes. matter in that. Yes, and okay. we can be like we can be like by like Lafayette, and be judicious and prudent and humble and and careful, you know, instead of just flying off the handle. Um, if 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 I were just to say, you know, if people want to take one thing away from this conversation, this this discussion would be: here's a really great book on this subject. It's How to Have Impossible Conversations by Peter Bogosian and James Lindsay. Um, fantastic! Oh. Um, just highly recommend it. They address they are addressing exactly this situation, and they say they basically walk through. It's, this is almost think of this like um, martial arts. Each of these levels are like a different belt. And, you know, first, just how do you have basic good conversations? Then how do you change minds? Then how do you improve your interventions? How do you have contentious conversations? How do you engage the closed mind? This is like getting harder and harder and harder up until like, you know, the point of hostage. They even, they even get into like hostage negotiation, which is like the hardest conversations. But the very last one, they, it, the very last chapter is conversing with ideologues. And it's like, wait mm -hmm. a second. That's where we are right now. We are, that's where we are. We are always, almost always conversing with ideologues, which is someone who holds their belief like dogmatically. It's someone who holds it without, it's like, this is completely true. I will not question it. And I, there and I, is no I, evidence that can make me change my mind on there this. There is no evidence. Exactly. There is and, no evidence. And, I, and so yeah, go ahead. I think one of the challenges there, as I'm thinking about it, because I definitely, you know, the the groups or the individuals come to mind that that I view as somewhat ide ideologues, right? But the challenge is they view you as an ideologue, right? They don't recognize, that's one of the huge challenges there is this projection that, yeah. that we all, you know, like, anyway, I, I it's really frustrating that people just assume that I'm only believing what I'm believing because I have to believe it, right? And And it's, 
it's rough. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's to me, this, this is a good way of thinking of, or like showing how bad the problem is the intro through expert level. So I don't know what belts that would be white through Brown or whatever. Um, there's 34 specific skills that these two gentlemen say you've got to work through these 34 before you can get to the black belt master level of, of conversing with ideologues. And yet we're all like white belts or yellow belts out there just battling it out. And we're, we're going to get nowhere, nowhere good. We're going to, we're going to, we're, we're just fracturing. We're just separating. We're just, all, all of the bad is happening and none of the good because we're at, that's where we are as a society. We're not, uh, we, we are that far apart in our, the, the views that we hold that, but we don't have the it skills. Yeah, it hasn't been modeled for us. We haven't been taught. We have our education system has broken apart. And I just, by nature, happen to be someone who loves to engage with people, especially people who disagree with me. That's just, I mean, the people who know me will laugh if they hear me say that because they're like, yeah, you think? Like that, I'm I, I, I'm known for that. I like to have the meaty conversations about areas where we disagree because I have this pathological need to test my assumptions and try to get to truth and, tr you know, but I don't know that that's normal. <laughs> I don't know that everyone is like that. But I think that trying to at least um, be, I don't know. I, I, I think that we need to be trained to do this better as a general populace, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I hope that, I hope this strikes the audience like it did me, the humility of like, oh my goodness, I, I, conversing with ideologues, ideologues is the hardest. It is the very hardest thing to do. And yet it's what's happening constantly around us and we're not ready for it. That should bring, that should bring a great deal of humility and, and concern and, and be, you know, more, be more like Lafayette. How do I, how do I disengage, prepare myself so I can go and do it better and not add to the problem? So, Excellent. Um, I love it. So here, here's here's a quote from, uh, and these both these both of these gentlemen either were originally, I think they're uh, Bogosian, Bogosian, I think is an atheist. Um, uh, James Lindsay was Lindsay, an atheist. Lindsay, I think, was. Yeah, and he's has now recognized. Over. Yeah, yeah. But so they, and I not... haven't heard Bogosian talk about it, but I know that he's not running his, his atheist conferences hmm. anymore. So he's, he's obviously not, he doesn't seem to be as bullish on being a missionary of atheism because maybe yeah. he's recognized, oh, there are some bad outcomes, just like so many other, um, I, uh, Hershey Ali, what's her first name? And I mean, there yeah. are, Ali, yeah. Yeah, there are many well-known atheists who are rethinking as they watch the result in society. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I bring that up um, because, you know, these are two people who come from that perspective, but they wrote this. This is in the this is in that last chapter for you know the master level. He said, you might therefore observe the following traits and behaviors uh, among ideologues, extreme sensitivity, hyper defensiveness, overt righteousness, unwillingness to hear an opposing point of view, disproportionate levels of anger, sharp and unfair accusations and demeaning or vilifying epithets. There are many others, all of there are many others, all of which involve some degree of hostility, self-righteousness, or entrenchment. One telling sign of entrenchment is responding to substantive discre disagreement with weaponized moral language. For example, responding to, I'm not sure that conclusion follows, with something implying you are a morally bad person, such as you just don't care about dead children. Almost all such discussions appear to play out on the level of facts, appear to play out on the level of facts or possibly name calling or screaming that that is conversations with ideologues seem on the surface to be about ideas, issues, ideas, and evidence, but underneath they're about moral issues ultimately rooted in the ideologues sense of identity, including their self-perception as a moral person and their sense of belonging to a community expect trouble. Placing wedges between someone's moral epistemology and the beliefs she has reached via that epistemology may cause identity quakes, or in our language, a faith crisis. An identity quake, and we talked about quakes last time, you know, with the culture stack at the moral layer, as the moral tectonic plates shift, we get the quakes. They're, they're seeing that kind of quake. They're using that quake analogy as well. We would say faith crisis, I think. An identity quake is the emotional reaction that follows from having one's core values disrupted. People may become defensive, lost, desperate, or angry. They may turn on you, deciding you're not to be trusted. You may even be dragged into your partner's identity quakes, the meaning conversation partner. Um, 
You may even be dragged into your conversation partner's identity quakes or lose their friendship. Over time, if her old sense of identity withers, she may grieve through feelings of denial, anger, depression, and guilt. And I was like, they nailed it. That is like, I see that, that those behaviors that they're talking about there is like constantly, that is, it's immediate, it's almost immediately where it goes. You, you get six back, six parties back and forth and it immediately goes to this place. And that's yeah. super sobering. It's just really sobering. That, that means we're conversing that with That immediately takes me back to Second Nephi 28, which I bring up often because it's, if you are founded on the sand, then you will tremble lest you shall fall. So you immediately become entrenched and defensive because you're trying to keep this sandy foundation in place. That's exactly what they're talking about. But I think that God wants, what we know, God wants that to be sorted through. So those of us who have gone through multiple faith readjustments, at least the sand falling away and trying to have to, trying to find the bedrock that's not sand, right? That That is something that actually serves us, that benefits us, that we're supposed to experience. And then when you are founded on the bedrock, you don't respond that same way. I, I don't feel nearly as threatened by ideas as I might have as a young mom, you know, or, or someone, I might sometimes do an eye roll when someone's saying something for the 200th time that's like, yeah. Um, Jacob was only talking to the Nephites. You know, you can be like, oh, this is exhausting, but it's not threatening is I think yeah. the difference. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think to expand on a topic we talked about last time, I think that one of the problems we do, we talked about clipping in, you know, you have a revelation moment and you can clip into that, but you can also clip into something false. And I, I was having a conversation with a missionary once and they were, they were having legitimate, fantastic experiences teaching the gospel to people. They were experiencing miracles. And they were just full of the spirit and full of, of testimony. It was wonderful. And then they talked about a, a talk that they had read that President Nelson had, a, a conference talk, and how wonderful it was. And this missionary said to me, I'm sure he has seen Jesus. And I thought, that's a non sequitur. That right there is right. a non sequitur. You, you know, I, I don't know. You know, as a you know, per, for, from Dallin H. Oaks, you know, seven years ago he hadn't. You know, at least if, if, if President Oaks was telling the truth, and and it doesn't really matter whether he has or not. But what we, it's like what we want to do is we get a clip in, and we want to associate with that clip and other things that we didn't actually get a a, com, a a witness of. But we start, you know, we start adding to it and saying these other things also have the same degree of validity and say, but. That those things get challenged, and that's when they start to peel off. That that's the yeah. that, those are the anchors that fail. I don't feel like the we one keep building. I, yeah, we keep building new sandcastles on that bit of rock that we found. Yes. Right, that's yeah. building. Yeah, mm -hmm. instead of pursuing those sandcastles to the point of them being made of stone, you know, built on the rock of Jesus Christ, and and we don't we and it's difficult to recognize the difference. Like, what am I? What did I actually receive a witness of? And what am I? shortcutting by glomming onto and saying, I'm sure this is true because that was true. Um, yeah. Just like you know, when Peter said, I know that Jesus is the Christ, therefore I'm not going to eat these animals. And then Christ doesn't say, no, you can't eat the animals. Like what? So he, you know, he had, he, he kind of glommed on anyway. So when Christ came into yeah. different, he's like, really? What? It, it kind of took him aback for a moment. Like, do I really? So um, be very careful about what you are holding as absolutely true uh, because we, we want we want to have absolute truth because then once we have absolute truth about something, we can continue on to the next thing. We can, we don't have to worry about that anymore. And so there's, I think there's a tendency, you know, to, to say this must also be true. And, and, and yet, yet it's now, this is now Sandy. Um, and it, be, it leads to this, at least to a, a, where you're going to, you're going to respond to someone threatening that found that foundation of yours. You respond like they just described here. So power. Um, what are we good list? What, yeah, what, yeah, it's a good list. What what are we trying to avoid? We're trying to avoid these guys. This is these are this is just a smattering of you know people who have brought about horror in their civilizations within their societies. Um, these are these are just these are examples of people who exercised power where they they were the ultimate authority. They were essentially God. Some of them thought they were God. And everyone in, so in that society was maneuvering themselves to be in favor with, to, you know, it's it's all about orienting yourself to this person and the regime that they create. It's, you know, marrying your daughter off in a way that's going to be advantageous. You know, it's like everything, you know, it's kind of like I once, uh, 
my cousin years ago was like, my wife's, pre- you know, my wife's due any minute. I really want her baby. I, w- I really want the baby to be born on December 31st so we can get the tax benefit. It's like you're orienting your life choices and desires to the regime that you're a part of. It's it's just what we do, right? Of course, that's a, that's a very, you know, a relatively inconsequential thing. But with these kinds of people, everything you do, they, they are the guiding star that you orient yourself to. And that is the story of, you know, that's the story of history. It's might makes right, law of the jungle, political maneuvering. Who's the threat? Who do I have to please? And if, you know, if deity enters the picture at all, the most powerful person often claimed to be God, claimed to be God's vessel. So disobedience to him, them was disobedience to God. That's where you get the divine right of kings. You now everything is centered around those power structures of those power hierarchies. Good and bad, right and wrong are defined by that person. And you align yourself to that. You adopt that. And it's extremely enticing power is. It gets things done. Um, it's, you know, think of how many of our cultural stories, like in the form of movies, it's about powerful people who make things right. They they right wrong. We, we flock to that. We want those kinds of heroes. And it's kind of like how the Book of Mormon uh, talks about how if you could have a king who could, would have that power and they would be righteous, that would be great. Unfortunately, you can't guarantee it. And even if they are good, the chances are, and this is where Aristotle comes in, he says the chances are that their offspring are going to be terrible because they're spoiled. And they, so you, so, so at that absolute power. Um, well, go ahead. The, the only way to not be a tyrant as a king is to not use the power. That's the trick. King Benjamin had the power and he never used it. The only, like, he requested the people to come and hear his sermon. But even there with him and Mosiah, we learned they labored with their own hands. They never commanded the people. So in a way, I mean, it's it's Lord of the Rings, right? The, the, one the only thing you, yeah, the only thing you can do with power is destroy it, is recognize the danger that it has. And yeah, yeah. exactly. So this is what we're trying to avoid everyone you know when we when we engage in conversations that lead us away from from connection and from truth this is the direction that we that we are least turning towards and, and you know when we see people talking about civil war it you know it takes a while to get there it has taken a while but if it happens it's going to also take a really long while if ever you know to to you know to get to get back to recover so <clears throat> And I would be um, I would be negligent if we didn't add that we also that last list, that last um, series of photographs, we have that in our history as well. So we have to recognize how close to home this is lurking at our our doors, right? And it's it's like not even the past. this this exists right now in places in the world. Mm-hmm. you know it's, it's right. not I'm like, talking about in our LDS past. Oh, oh we yeah. had. We have had difficult regimes that that right. structured morality that everyone had to align underneath right. And, right. and that accomplished great things, though. Right. The Lord continues to do his work, his work through all of this, all of this mess that we as mortals make. And I think the worst way to take the Lord's name in vain is to claim to be speaking on behalf of the Lord when you're serving your own purposes. Right. Yeah. But I just needed to add that this is not something to go like, oh, that doesn't apply to us as yeah. American Mormons, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I think the Book of Mormon shows that it totally does apply. I mean, it's yeah. you know, written for our day. So the, um, it, and this is, this is again, the 30,000 foot view of, we recognize that power is, is, is a real problem throughout history. And the U.S. founding, the, the founders, they saw it too. They were looking at, just like, so in Aristotle, we talked about Aristotle last time. He wrote this book called Ethics, which talks about how how do you create a society? You know, how do you pursue happiness? Uh, it's got to be through virtue, which you learn from the voice of God speaking to you. When you have people that can then build a society based on justice and truth rather than power, so he so he says that's he start he gets to that point, and then he writes another book called Politics, and in that book he starts to look at all the different governmental types from the past and which ones you know what were their problems with them. You know, he he said for example that monarchy is obsolete. He said that 2,300 years ago. And still today, we still have monarchies. We didn't, <laughs> we didn't, you know, we didn't listen. He's like, that one doesn't work. Um, the, the, the founders of the United States did the same thing 2,000 years after Aristotle. They looked back at the, the fledgling attempts at representative types of government from the Greek and, uh, you know, the Greek, the Greek republics. And what they wrote, what uh, Hamilton wrote in Federalist 9 is, 
I think is very sobering and important, you know, that, that we all know that they they look at the what those people, what those representative governments, what those societies experienced. They, they had feelings of horror and disgust at the distractions with which they're continually agitated, the rapid succession of revolutions, the, st the state of perpetual vibration, the extremes of tyranny and anarchy, the furious storms, the tempestuous waves of sedition and party rage. And I think sometimes that actually feels like he's writing today. You know, it's like, it's like, that wasn't that long. It's like, I feel that whenever there's, especially when there's like something going on with an election or with, with candidates or something like that. It's like, I start to feel this kind of vibe in our, in our society. But they saw that like, we don't want the absolute ruler, but the attempts at representative governments had their own rocky, had their own problems that were severe. What do we do about that? And, oh, and maybe you're going to get to this, but I feel thankful that even though those, those things have been present in the discourse, the social fabric has been strong enough that they haven't ripped apart and become embodied for the most part. Like we did have a horrible summer of riots and lockdowns and craziness, but in general, that's not what, what we experience in America because people need to understand because the social fabric is still holding together. Yeah. But that's yeah. why we can't keep fraying it. We have to keep yeah. stitching it together. Don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. Yes. And so as, as they were, so jumping over to Federalist One, <clears throat> he, he, they're like, okay, how, what do we do about this? You know, and he said, um, our true interests, uninfluenced by considerations foreign to the public good, but this is more art. Let's see. Let me actually back up. Happy will it be if our choice should be directed by a judicious estimate of our true uh, uh, interests, uninfluenced by considerations foreign to the public good. But this is more ardently to be wished for than seriously to be expected. Uh, you have to like, it takes a little while to read these. You know, we don't, mm -hmm. they're harder to read than, uh, than they, they, they're, they're anyway. Um, let's look at that. Let's look at that for a minute. <clears throat> the, yeah. Go ahead. The universal good, public good is the universal good, right? Mm -hmm. So there can be interests that are looking out for themselves, not looking out for the good of all of us collectively. And I don't mean collectively in a socialist sense, I mean, not acting selfishly. So we do have this problem with corporations and with bad laws. Like we're on the verge of fascism in both directions, both toward the left and to the right and have been for a long time, right? Because yeah. people are using government and manipulating it for their own good instead of being service-minded, servant leader-minded to try to serve the public good. What is the best thing for everybody? Yeah, and his point is you can't depend upon that desire to always hold among people who might be put into power. You know, human nature ardent. is human nature. Human yeah. nature is human nature. Yeah. Um, this is more ardently to be wished for than to seriously to be expected. It's like, that would be really great if, if men, men were angels and they're not. So he said, as Jefferson, he, said, yeah. as Jefferson said, yeah. <clears throat> so then they say, um, the plan offered to our deliberations affects too many particular interests, innovates upon too many, too many local institutions, not to involve in its discussion a variety of objects extraneous to its merits and the views, passions, and prejudices little favorable to the discovery of truth. Meaning that there's, there's motive. If, if you get a little bit of wealth, a little bit of power, a little bit of what the things that you want, you are usually more interested in retaining those things, no matter what it does to anyone else, than saying, you know, no, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be the King Benjamin that says, I'm going to continue to work. Instead of saying, God told me that you need to support me. I, you know, it's like, no, I'm going to, so as soon as you get a little bit of what you want you, and you're trying to keep it, um, those, you know, the, the, the line between good and evil runs through every human heart, you know, that, that problem. Yeah. And so you got to watch out for that when you're establishing what kind of, you know, how do we run society knowing that no matter who you put in as the magistrate, as the, as the, in the place of government or in a place of power, these human nature immediately, you know, comes to play on them. Can I, that, and again, that's Joseph Smith, right? As soon as men get a little power, as they suppose, they immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. And I yeah. think this shows up in all of us. As I watch my children watching the older siblings treat the younger siblings using power, right? Or even as a mom, when it's like, all of you go to bed because I want to eat ice cream and watch a movie. And I don't want any of you to know that I'm doing that. And I don't, you know what I mean? I don't want you to all eat ice cream. Like, I'm not putting them to, to bed for their sakes. I'm doing it for my sake. I think this yeah. is something that all of us have to be aware of all the time in whatever yes. realm of, of authority we have, because it doesn't just show up when you are in some 
public position of power. It's a constant for all of us. For all Am I of using us. the fact that I have power for my own selfish interests instead of for the good of those who I have authority over? It's a yeah. constant struggle. Yeah. And so the, 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 the ice cream in the movie just are just the manifestation at that level, but that same impulse right. would manifest in a different way in a higher level. If, if I'm doing that as a mom, if I were the queen, that tells me what I would be doing. Right. Yeah. So if yeah. I can recognize that impulse in myself and say, okay, I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to go read a book to my kids, put them to bed in a loving way. If there's still time, I'll have some ice cream in the movie, but that's probably not that good for me anyway. Then I can know that I could be entrusted with a little more authority without abusing it. Yes, exactly. Yes. He continues saying, among the most formidable of the obstacles which the new constitution will have to encounter may readily be dis distinguished, may readily be distinguished the obvious interest of a certain class of men in every state to resist all changes which may hazard a diminution or a, a reduction of their power, emolument, and consequence of the office since they hold under the state establishment, the sta state establishments, and the perverted ambition of another class of men who will either hope to aggrandize themselves by the confusion of their country or will flatter themselves with fair prospects of elevation from the subdivision of the empire into several partial confederacies. So you, it's like we got to watch out for two types of bad, uh, two types of, of problems. One is those who are going to like, I don't want to, I don't want a reduction of my power. So I'm going to resist whatever good thing you're doing. And you've got another class who are like, I'm going to support what you're doing because I think, or I'm going to, I'm going to maneuver in such a way I'm that I'm going to utilize it. it. I'm, it's going to split things apart and I'm going to, I'm going to be, it's going to be advantageous to me that it falls apart. So there's those who want it to fall apart. There's those who want to keep it the way it is. Anyway, so it's extremely tricky. This, this chess game of yeah. how do you improve society? Because there's the motivations of the people involved to keep it the way it is, or to have it completely fall apart to their advantage. Well, yeah, so it's tyranny and anarchy, right? The true, the true division. From my American heritage class in BYU, um, however many twenty whatever years ago, that the real axiom, the you know, the real line is between anarchy and tyranny, and that's exactly what we're talking about. One side wants to increase the tyranny, the other side wants to increase the anar anarchy in order to use it to establish more tyranny, right? Yes, yes. and just bounces okay. back and forth. Bonk, 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 yeah, bonk. yeah. So continuing in Federalist One, <clears throat> the um, here's so th those are the bad people. Now, what about the good people? We even have problems with the good people. It says the honest errors of mind led astray by preconceived jealousies and fears. So that's so you got to watch out for that. People who are well intentioned, but they have mis you know pre preconceived no notions, biases, jealousies, fear that that you know, even though they are they're honorable and they have good intentions, they have those things that are swaying them. So numerous indeed and so powerful are the causes which serve to give a false bias to the judgment that we upon many occasions see wise and good men on the wrong as well as on the right side of questions of the first magnitude of society. So even among the most important issues that come before us, even the best of people will, what we're going to see on the, it's like they're just kind of split down the middle. We'll on the, on the on, on either the right wrong side or the right side, because so numerous and powerful are the causes which give serve to a false bias of the judgment, you know, which goes back to what, you know, Aristotle said is part of happiness is knowing, having, you know, virtue, wisdom, judgment, wisdom is the knowledge of things that don't change. Judgment is the knowledge of things that do change. And this is why it's like, how, how do you make these difficult dis determinations? So he's like, even the best of people the, it's, it's just so hard. And then going to the green, this circumstance, if duly attended to, would always furnish a lesson of moderation to those who are engaged in any controversy, like polygamy, however well persuaded of being in the right. So we should be humble. We should be moderate because we should see that we're, we're not suddenly the, gen the only genius that God put on earth and we suddenly know everything. So we should be very moderate and circumspect and let me hear you. Um, if we're jumping into the fray thinking that we know everything like certain videos that have been released recently, um, that's, we should, that this should be a lesson on to other us. channels, on, on other on, channels, on other channels about me, not engaging with me, just talking about me, just talking about you. Yeah. Um, a further Refusing reason to engage. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Just so you know, anyone who ever does a video about me, I'm, I always offer to engage. In fact, the build real, um, discussion, I'm just, I'm just going to go here for a second. It's a sidetrack, but yeah. Do you guys, I don't know if any of you know how hard I worked to set that up. That was all me 
do and I had to bring other people to it reluctantly dragging their feet refusing to respond for a long time so just so people know I'm never hesitant if anyone wants to have a conversation with me who disagrees let me know and as long as I have time I am more than willing to engage so anyway continue I'm sorry to and interrupt you, and you make time it's yeah you make time it's amazing uh, it continues, he says, a further reason for caution in this respect might be drawn from the reflection that we are not always sure that those who advocate the truth are activated by purer principles than their antagonists. Meaning that oh, so someone who is advocating for like, you're right, they might have their own reasons for doing that to like, to, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a Malachia, you know, <clears throat> getting into a position, positioning himself into, you know, to be second of command. By making, you know, the king think, oh, this guy's on my side because he's doing the things that I want. Well, he was weaseling his way in so he mm -hmm. could then get into a place of power. Or can I use a kind of funny example? When when the whole um, green movement became and we needed to, use, you know, we needed to save the earth. And you would go to ho a hotel and they would have a little sign that would say, in order to use less water and energy, we will not be washing the towels or the sheets. So they were claiming a moral good because, it, you know, in order to be self-serving, it was so obvious that they just were saving money by doing less laundry, but claiming it was in service of this greater moral good. That's kind of what we're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, not always sure that they're activated by pure principles and their antagonists. Into the blue, ambition, avarice, personal animosity, party opposition, and many other motives not more laudable than these are apt to operate as well upon those who support as those who oppose the right side of a question. So it's, this is a very difficult you know, we, we take sides and say, you're my ally, ally, you're my enemy. We don't realize how difficult of a game this really, that this really is. <clears throat> Were there not even these inducements to moderation? So we still talk about moderation. Nothing could be more ill-judged than that intolerant spirit, which has at all times characterized political parties. For in politics as in religion, it is equally absurd to aim at making proselytes by fire and sword heresies in either can rarely be cured by persecution, <clears throat> which kind of leads into what, you know, it. the rest of the, it's like, oh, heresies, you know, because people, you know, there's her there's heresy, you know, accusations flying everywhere. All of it, everywhere. They can rarely be cured by persecution. That one line, like, thank you, Hamilton. We should like all be wearing that on our t-shirts or putting it on our monitors and reminding ourselves when we engage, persecution does not cure heresy as we perceive it. Right. Are you going to convert somebody through insults? Should we right. send our missionaries out to tell people how awful they are? And right. It's it's amazing. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes. Uh, this, yeah. Go ahead. Keep go going. Ahead. Nope. Keep going. That's good. Um, which, which brings us back to um, the, the the same the one that we talked about last time. Um, you know, Lord, Lord Acton. Uh, so this again, moderation. Why? Why do we be moderate? Why do we not be so absolute in our in our trust? And in our opinions, and this goes back, we, sh we shared this quote last time, but it's it's relevant to this part of our conversation of Lord Acton. He's the one who said that power tends to corrupt. Absolute power tends to corrupt. Absolutely. That great men are almost always bad men, which we showed a bunch of them a minute ago. Even when they exercise influence and not authority, still more when you super add the tendency or the certainty of corruption by authority. So there are those who want to be in power and there's those who want to be in influence. And almost always they have they have bad motivations, a bunch of which... Jefferson just laid out. He just laid out a bunch of the motivation. There's, they're coming from, they are seeing their way to get, get what they want by something other than honest value add to society. And, and this, is, this is kind of a humbling one that kind of, I think that the top, the top paragraph here kind of hits close to home on the, on the church front. He says, I cannot accept your canon, meaning your absolute certainty, that we are to judge Pope and King unlike other men, with a favorable presumption that they did no wrong. If there is any presumption, it is the other way against holders of power. Increasing Whoa. as the power increases, historic responsibility has to make up for the want of legal responsibility. So I, I think of, you know, I, I, I love Elder Oaks. I have learned so much from him. He said at one time, and no one else I've heard say it, so maybe this is just his well-considered opinion, not said by the all, all 15, but he said, you can't criticize church leaders even if it's true. And it's like, that's like the worst thing you could say from a position that's of power. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's like, because it's, it, you have to, it's like, if I say, if I say this, it has to be true for anyone in power. Can anyone in mm -hmm. power anywhere say that? 
And the answer is no. You know, which which brings us back to. Um, well, people do say it, but not people we would admire in societies we would want to live in. That is a dangerous yeah. abuse of authority. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I, I think that J. Reuben Clark's, uh, his his idea is much yeah. more, I don't have it here, but the, the idea that if we have truth, great. If we don't, it needs to be questions. It needs to yeah. be destroyed. If we have truth, it cannot be harmed by investigation. If we have not truth, it ought to be harmed. Yes. And I might yeah. not have gotten it perfectly, but it's it's darn close to that. It's better than like I did. That. Yeah. That, that's the attitude that we need to have, you know, that we should welcome. All truth is circumscribed into one great whole. So whether you're coming at it from revelation or from from empiricism or from reason, it if it's true, it can withstand the attack. And if it can't, mm -hmm. maybe you should look at yourself and how well you're prepared. You know, if you're saying don't right. attack me, don't bring a different viewpoint on on this. Like don't don't question my rev, my revelatory based you know position with 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 history. Um, we're, right. we're, we're ignoring the all truth can be circumscribed to one great whole. It, it, truth can withstand examination. Yep. And I don't even like using the word attack because I don't feel like it usually is attack. It's almost like critique or feedback or requests. You know, if I, as a parent say, you cannot, you cannot ever criticize me and you can't ever tell me what you need. I yeah. will tell you when you have to go to the bathroom. I will tell you when you need to eat because I have authority over you and God will let me know exactly what you need. That doesn't work. That's a, that's terrible. And so we shouldn't see, expect, just like I said, the abuse of a power of, of authority is the exact same principle from the very most local level to the very most elevated level. The same is true of the principles of good leadership. They are exactly the same principles that follow. And I'm the best mom when I'm listening the most yeah. and trying the best I can to interact with my children and taking their feedback. Like I love the fact that I have worked so hard to not be defensive. So when my adult children let me know something I did that really hurt them, I can really hear them and have my heart break and not, not say, well, I did the best I could or something that would really damage the relationship rather than strengthening the relationship. Cause I can hear and I can say, Oh my gosh, I wish I could do that over again. I'm really sorry. You know? Yeah. And cause that goes along with elder Oaks, president Oaks also saying we don't apologize. And that's right. another pretty, oh. like, I hope, I hope we don't actually still believe that. I hope yeah. that that has been thought about a little bit more. I, I would like to think. Yeah. Yeah. So, Again, 30,000 foot view, the alternative to power is king, which um, came, the, the alternative came about with the enlightenment, with which sprang from a Judeo-Christian worldview. So theists like ourselves say, hey, we're all children of God. He is the one true king. He, we are all equal in his eyes. He defines what's good and right. We're accountable to him for our actions. And on, on the non-theist side, they will say either I don't believe in God or I know I'm not God and I know you're not either. So I can't set myself up as. And that's where yeah. we start to get into the enlightenment, the whole enlightenment idea. So while power corrupts, and, and there's also the recognition, this comes from John Locke, that while power corrupts, power or force is necessary to defend life, liberty, property, which, be, that, which is why that's the only legitimate role of government. You don't let it do anything else because it will corrupt. Um, John Locke's second uh, treatise on government is, is a, a great place to go for that one. So everything else... <clears throat> In a, in, a, in a society that says we minimize power and we isolate it and have it do this very specific thing, it's like, okay, well, how do we do everything else? Everything else must be accomplished through discussion, conversation, debate, persuasion, cooperation, competition, consent. That's why learning how to have conversations is so crucial because it's supposed to how we're do, supposed to do everything in society except for life, liberty, and property, which does, does entail force. Yeah. Um, so I feel we, like this whole time you've just been outlining Doctrine and Covenants 121 for us, right? Yeah. Isn't that exactly what we're what we're going yeah. over? Okay. Yeah, which we're going to quote here in just a minute because it. Okay. Yeah, it's like it's almost like all of these ideals were encapsulated in a much smaller space because God is so efficient that way in DNC 121. Um, <clears throat> if if you allow power, like I I want to I just want to use power for this one other thing, pa um, all of its attendant vices come into play. It's Ursula and the Little Mermaid. I want you to use your power to give me this thing that I want. It's like, okay, let's do the bargain. It's like, what do you give up? Um, and you you give up using, you, you start using force. Um, I, 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 I think of, for example, um, 
during the during the founding during the constitutional convention they had all of these you know brilliant people meeting and discussing and voting on so the the consequence of the conversation was very high because if you couldn't articulate your point and somebody else could do it better and then a vote was held it's like that went into the draft which then was going to be totally voted on so so the stakes were very high when when stakes are high i don't know that our brains work so well and so what they did they had this brilliant mechanism called the committee of the whole where they said we want to be able to have conversation without the threat of a vote meaning a vote of four because if you vote and you're outvoted that the force of the majority yeah alters the draft of the constitution. We need to be able to work this through. We yeah. need to be able to work this through. Yeah. So they created this thing called the committee of the whole. And all it was, was they just said, we are now, can we vote to go into the committee of the whole? Yes. And so now we're into this place that has no force. It's just yeah. discussion. And yeah. that's, that's that model. And so they were able to back and forth, back and forth. And when they were able to wrestle through that stuff and feel like they could really articulate their, their points well, they would vote to go out of the committee of the whole and back into the, the space where it really mattered and then actually do that where, where you know, where the high, it down went from low stakes to high stakes. The mm -hmm. problem that we face in our society is we, because we have allowed power to be, to, to come into almost every aspect of society, instead of saying only life, liberty, and property, we're now in high stakes all the time. We're now in high stakes all the time. We're not in low stakes. So when we go talk about morality or or politics, we're in high stakes mode. So the lizard brain kicks in. It's like my identity is threatened, my my way of life. You know what? You know what? Because I know you can vote on it, and I know that that um, the the legislature will vote on something that will they'll use power to force your view upon me. And it's not about life, liberty, and property. It's about something else. And so now we're in high stakes mode all the time. We're not in committee of the whole. The idea was that society would exist in committee of the whole, and you would you would carry out whatever it was you were going to do. The, the best way to educate, the best way to parent, the best way to heal, to travel, to build, to live, to feed people, to sleep, to exercise, to play, to inspire through the arts. All those things would be done in the low stakes committee, the whole type of an environment where if you agree with somebody, great, go off and form an organization with them, form a business, form a church, form a, you know, the arts, you know, put together a, 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 you know, whatever it is, but it's completely through cooperation and persuasion, not we've all decided that this is the way you should educate your children. This is the way you should eat. This is the way you should take care of your health care. Now it's imposed upon everyone. And so that that's so I'm kind of getting ahead of myself in that. But that's what's happened. And I, I think that's a very it's a helpful way to look at it. It's like, oh, we've moved from what should have been low stakes for everything except for life, liberty and property into a high stakes environment all the time. And so everyone is always keyed up. Everyone's always watching who's, who's threatening me. And that's, yeah. and that's the space we're but in. But I think in a way it's an illusion. I think that's a deception because I've, I've had the thought several times, this conversation that I could engage in right now and have it be super um, contentious because we both see it so strongly, doesn't have any impact at all in the broader society. Do you know what I mean? So we're all engaging in these conversations that are moot points. And so so ideally, we can see past that and see this isn't a high stakes conversation. It doesn't need to be. It has no power other than to either strengthen or weaken this, rela this relationship I have right here with the person I'm engaging with. Right. And so maybe you're going to get there, but that's how I'm like, it's, it's, it, we're not really in high stakes as we're none of us engaging in any of these. These are not high stakes conversations. It's, I think you have a really good point. It's not high stakes from a legal standpoint. It's high stakes from an identity standpoint. And oh, this okay. Goes back, okay. This goes back to the impossible conversations quote here where they, they see where they said it. Um, <clears throat> issues of identity. Second paragraph. Um, second paragraph. Uh, let's see here. Underneath, they're about moral issues ultimately rooted in the ideologue's sense of identity, including yeah. their self-perception as a moral person and their sense of belonging to a community. So you are threatening their identity, their community, their yeah. position from which they approach the world. So whether it's whether it's a legislative high stakes or an identity high stakes, that seems to be where we we, we not that it necessarily really is, but our brain puts us in one. Yes. That's what I feel like, because during 2020, for example, when many of us felt actually excluded from our communities and like we did not have access to 
you know, all kind of like going to the store or if we wouldn't comply in certain ways that some of us were unable to comply with it, when somebody would support that, it did feel like a direct threat because I am being excluded from my society and you're the reason why, because you support this. So yeah, we have to work really hard yeah. to get past feeling like it's high stakes. Yes. And that, and that I guess is an invitation to extend, you know, to our audience here is back up and say, is this really high stakes or low stakes? It's, it's really, it, it, we, we do still live in a society where it can be low stakes. It, it is low stakes. We should, we should at least approach it from that perspective. Um, otherwise we get into this, I, like my identity is threatened and we go right to all, you know, the, all the animosity and things that they were talking about, about mm -hmm. earlier. So, and you know what, the high stakes yeah. conversations are the ones where we actually have to show up the best because yes. they're high stakes. So we should be yes. using all of those low stakes conversations yes. to develop these skills the best we can. So that when we are in a high stakes conversation, yes. for example, someone messaged me, I, I just, it's so sad, but maybe when you're in a conversation with your stake president, that might be a very high stakes conversation. Mm -hmm. Ideally you have, um, perfected or at least mastered these tools of engagement so that when you are in the high stakes um, conversation, you can show up in the very best way possible with the most inspiration. That is, that's a great point. The low stakes environment is where we practice yeah. so that in the high stakes environment, we can do it really, really well. And, and it's so crucial because if power is not the goal, then truth becomes the goal. Truth, truth absolutely. And truth, truth, you know, like Jordan Peterson said, truth is the antidote to suffering. You know, the I think I even put that on the on the on the slide here. <clears throat> we want to minimize power, maximize persuasion. Truth is the antidote to suffering. Um, what is the best way to to do all those things? You know, educate, parent, heal, travel, build, live, feed, do the arts. We can. Those, those, there's a true best way compared to what we're doing right now. There's a next level of improving in all those ways. We're looking for that. You know, we're looking to improve the state of the art compared to truth, not, not compared to some power hierarchy. And the state, mm -hmm. of the, the state of all of those arts develops exponentially as humans turn their energy from navigating a power hier hierarchy to navigating a truth or merit hierarchy. When we're focusing our, our energy on a profession, on a hobby, and, and moving the, the ball forward or the, or the state of the art forward, we all improve. You know, when, when someone creates a better, you know, widget, a better mousetrap, we all, a better iPhone, whatever, we all improve. And that's that's what we live in right now. And that's actually one of the things that's at stake. It may not be the most important things that's at stake, but the, the standard it's of- It's pretty important. That, it's pretty important, yeah. The the standard of, even the ability for you and I to have this conversation, to have the, the leisure time, this the slack in our schedule, if that, if that really is that. Yeah, because the technology, the resources of learning that we can learn all of these things to have these higher level conversations, all of this, is built on the shoulders of so many things that we take for granted that could disappear if we lose truth. Yes. Right. When you are living in North Korea, they are not having these kinds of conversations. Yeah. Or when you look at a picture of the globe from space and like North Korea is all dark. Yeah. That's that's why it's dark. You know, it's like you look at everything around you as you go through through you know through your day. It's like somebody spent thousands of hours or possibly their whole lifetime getting the thing that you see from the prior state that it was in, you know, that iPhone it's like how many engineers made the, the current phone that you have, you know, and I just I get to buy that for X dollars and I have it. It's the benefit of how many man years, you know, and that is the benefit of living in a society that's, that is focused on truth and merit instead of power. So that's another yeah. benefit of living in a, in a, in a truth environment. I was, so, I was, oh, I was listening to a book recently. Let me just add to that because I think it kind of plays along so, somewhat. And they were talking about, because sometimes the idea of self-reliance is really appealing. Like, I want to be able to make everything I need myself, you know? And it was good for me listening to this book. It might have been Brett Weinstein, Brett, and we Brett Weinstein and Heather Haying, but it might have been something else. But they were talking about how an Inuit still living in that ind indigenous way can do everything they need for life right? They, they are completely self-sustaining and self-reliant. Self However, you get a hundred Inuits and all they can do is sustain their own lives. You get a thousand, you get a million, they each can sustain their own life. We in our society can't even begin to do everything we need to sustain our own life. Like we're completely dependent how, and, and interconnected. However, you get a hundred of us together and we can accomplish these incredible things. You get a thousand, you know, you get all of us together. It's like that 
ex that um, experiment. I don't know who said it. I don't think it was Thomas Sowell. Maybe it was the shorter guy that's also the, oh, what's his name from the University of Chicago? I can't remember who it was, but the pencil example, like, can you make a pencil? Yeah. Right? Who, who was it that said that? And uh, I don't remember, but you're right. Yeah, the idea that no yeah. one in the world yeah. knows how to make a pencil. There is no right. one knows. How to, yeah. And yet right. we have and then that's next level for a cell phone or a computer or an automobile, right? And yet, because we are not all, it, you have to choose. You can either be completely self reliant or you can be interconnected and accomplish much greater things. But it depends on interconnectivity in a way based on truth, not power. Because the second power comes in, the ships are going to start sinking, the planes are going to start crashing. It has to be done according to truth, not according to power. Exactly. Exactly. And so that, that, you know, adding to our little stack of what are the things at stake in having good conversations in, in disagreeing agreeably, I see all of this as being in the balance, you know, that we know if we're, if it's a high stake poker game, that that's part of what's in the pot is all of the benefit of living in a, in a truth-based society. Um, the, the operating system that makes all of this possible is to see, I want to make sure I'm not getting out of order here. <clears throat> I am getting a little out of order. So the Milton Friedman. I had to look up his name because it's making me crazy. I could remember Milton. Sorry. Did he, did he write I, I Pencil? There, okay. I yeah. don't know if it was him, but that's the name that came to mind. Okay. If you haven't read that, you got to go look up I Pencil and you got to read that. It's it's a uh, yeah. You get a a, 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 an appre a greater appreciation for oh, this is the. I mean, it's like all of a sudden that toilet paper was scarce a few years ago. It's like it's yeah. that easy. It's that easy for this. It's fragile. It's beautiful. It's powerful, but it's fragile. You know, the, the society mm -hmm. built on on truth and merit. So it's incredibly resilient if we're trying to do the right things, as Jordan Peterson yes. would say, if we're aiming up, yes. because yes. we have made so many mistakes and we constantly are. And there's so much corruption and it's still functioning. Very it's forgiving. incredibly fragile as we've caved, carved out all of the foundations of it. And it could collapse any time if we don't start doing better. Yeah. So how, how do we how do we have conversations with people? Um, John Locke, in his letter considering uh, concerning toleration, gave us gave us that the idea of of tolerance for other people's beliefs comes out of him. So that the idea of tolerance in our society comes from John Locke, and he got it he got it out of Christianity. And I think this is an important point to to understand that one of the prices of the benefits of a truth based society is the the price to be paid is to be tolerant of others and engage with them lovingly and respectful, respectfully. And these are some of the key, the key ideas that he, that he is, that he espoused and said, <coughs> excuse me, that where we get that from, he said, tolerance is the chief characteristic mark of the true church, which is like, what are you talking about? You look at the history of the church. That's not at all, but he, he's saying they were wrong if they weren't acting in this way for everyone is orthodox to himself and antiquity, pomp, and Re reformation are much rather marks of men striving for power and empire over one another. So he's saying, it, when you saw them doing it wrong, they weren't pursuing Christianity. They were pursuing their, you know, those were marks of men striving for power and empire over one another. The business of true religion is not to the exercising of compulsive force, but to the, re like getting someone removed from the church, but to the regulating of men's lives, according to the rules of virtue, Aristotle, and piety. Whosoever will list himself under the banner of Christ must in the first place, and above all things, make war on his own lusts and vices. So where's our primary initial focus? It's inward. What does Christ want me to do? And that that is, you know, when we go to church, that's exactly what it's about. When we say it's about discipleship over scholarship, it needs to be. We need institutions that are about discipleship over scholarship. That doesn't mean we reject scholarship, but we need institutions like churches, like our church, that focuses on how do you make war on your less and vices. You know Amen. what? That's so true because anytime we are listening to a gospel sermon or anything else, and our thoughts are, oh, so and so really needs to hear this. <laughs> We're doing it wrong, doing right? It wrong. And like, like it's always amusing to me when people will send me a. I, I've been tagged before in the middle of a conference talk while it's still happening, being like, Michelle Stone, you need to be listening to this, you know. And it's like, I okay, like, like you know, that is not that is not what Jesus did. Compared to Jesus, everyone was doing it wrong. Everyone had wrong ideas on everything. He was never the one that was sticking his finger in their eye and that was excluding and that was telling them they were not worthy and were not allowed to be there. The opposite, right? He even taught us 
take the beam out of your own eye before getting the mode out of like, but how do we miss this lesson? I feel like that's exactly what Locke is saying here. It's yeah. the same exact message. Yes. And I don't, I don't know if Locke read, or I don't know if Joseph Smith read Locke, but this sounds a lot like DNC 121. No man can be a Christian without charity and without that faith, that faith, which works not by force, but by love. He who is That's cruel, also in the New Testament though. So, so true. I think, yes, yes. yeah. And which is where he mm -hmm. got it, right? He who mm -hmm. is cruel and implacable towards those that differ from him in, in opinion is indulgent to iniquities and immoralities as are unbecoming the name of Chris, of a Christian. It's like, I'm, I have all these videos going through my mind of people who have, a ta or, or, or comments. It's like cruel and implacable. Yeah, they're being indulgent to iniquities, but and yet they think they're being righteous. You know, they think they're defending the truth. He plainly yes, demonstrates. Yeah, oh my gosh. We yeah. see that. I'll, I'm sorry. I keep having to chime in, but it's like thinking that standing for, as a mess, as a standing as a witness of Christ at all times and in all things and in all places means telling everyone where they're wrong as much yeah. as possible is so backward. Like yeah. what does Christ do with each of us? He loves us, right? He yeah. loves us. And then we are gently able to be taught by the spirit. Yeah. What is, it's so fascinating to so watch. Backward. Yeah. Cause, cause they, yeah. they often move right into the cruel and implacable space. And so you know, like yeah. when, I said, when I said last time that you know, our education falls so short, this is one of the areas that we fall so short, not, not realizing, you know, these basic principles that are necessary to having a free people. If you want to have a power hierarchy society, you don't need this. You don't need this at all. It's only if you want to be free people. He plainly you know what? The, yeah. I, I have to go back because that one, I know I said, don't listen to things, applying them to someone else. But I have to break my own rule a little bit because we automatically do it to some extent. But that right there is cult think, right? A cult is kind of the opposite of freedom. And I don't mean how people call Mormonism a cult. I mean the actual legitimate cults where they really won't let you leave and they'll all shame you into compliance and things like even how you discipline your children. Are you whipping your six-month-old sufficiently as our cult requires? Mm -hmm. And so when we have people with a cult mindset as one of the people who's been coming after me has very much a cult mindset and is doing exactly this. It's so he who is cruel and implacable towards those that differ from his opinion is indulgent to iniquities and immoralities as are unbecoming the name of a Christian. That's yeah. fascinating to me that because again, it's do we want freedom? And the only way to get to freedom is through truth. And the only way to get through truth is through free th thought and free discourse without the fear of reprisal for having an idea or fleshing out an idea. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, anyway, yeah. that just applies so directly to what we're talking about. Exactly. Yeah. He plainly demonstrates by his actions that it is another kingdom he aims at and not the advancement of the kingdom of God, which is, I mean, it's amazing that we can be so certain that we're aiming for the kingdom of God. But if John Locke, and I would say that jo that DNC 121, Joseph Smith and the Lord is, is, is right there hand in hand. That there's yeah, this is right. Kingdom. Yeah. This is yeah. right from the Bible and yeah. thus the book of Mormon and the doctrine and yeah. covenants. Yeah. Um, if like the captain of our salvation, Jesus, we sincerely desire the good of souls, we would tread in the steps and follow the perfect example of that Prince of Peace who sent out his soldiers to the subduing of nations and gathering them into his church, not armed with the sword or other instruments of force, but prepared with the gospel of peace and with the exemplary holiness of their conversation. The holiness of their conversation, you know, that was his method. The toleration of those that differ from others in matters of religion is so agreeable to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to the genuine reason of mankind that it seems monstrous for men to be so blind as to not perceive the necessity and the ad advantage of it in so clear a light. And yet, we don't. The toleration of those who differ from, uh, from others in matters of religion is so agreeable. So tolerance of people who are different than you is like core to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet how often do we, is that, is that the way we act? Yeah. It's so, and you know what we need to do better because the people that um, often like, like sometimes the people who are, who differ from me politically differ probably from both of us politically and that are yelling about tolerance are some of the least tolerant, right? It's so yeah. easy to espouse your own team's perspective and then really other and demonize anyone who doesn't doesn't see it the same way. And so I think that this is something that we all need to be constantly um, questioning in our own hearts and checking in, checking in, checking in. That's the best yes. I think that we yeah. can do. Yes. If, it, if it's not 
because I mean, this is the father of toleration, or at least the articulation of it. So if you're not doing it the way he said, I think you're doing it wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think I moved this, those slides. Yeah. So our social contract. So the, the con, so like, what is our social contract? What is it that we all agree to? Like, these are the traffic rules of life that we're all going to live by. Um, yeah, I think we should define that a little bit better for people who aren't familiar with it. Because I'm wondering if people might be lost. Do you want to, like, contract? isn't the social contract kind of like the axiomatic things we understand? Like, you stop at a red light, you don't assault people. Like, yeah. like in our, our society is weird, is what, who is it that calls it weird societies? Like, the fact that a woman can walk down the street without being assaulted is not normal throughout human history. Right. right. And it's our social contract that makes that possible because we all are born in this society where we are brought up with certain understandings. And it's this is how you behave. And so when I watch like my child in an orchestra performance or, a, you know, and and they're all sitting on their chairs following the music in an orderly way. I'm like, this is essential. This is so important in our society because it teaches people to cooperate this way by following the social contract. If you are in this orchestra, you are following this contract. That's the conductor. This is the music. The, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's It's kind of the music we create by all doing our role well in our society. And we have broken that to a great extent. Part yes. of it used to be you work and you contribute or you suffer the consequences. Although I'm glad we have a... Um, Safety uh, um, a, a safety net, you know, we've, we've extended it too much to where you, you don't have to follow hammock. all of the well, hammock instead of a safety net. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I, I just wanted to help people understand what this means. The social contract is just kind of, you didn't sign it. You just were born into it. And it's the understanding of this is what I do in this society to be a free citizen. To yes. contribute. If someone breaks a, a social contract, that generally means they would need to be arrested or fined or ticketed or something in a moral way. It's not an abuse of power on the government's behalf. It's yeah. it's we need to enforce the social contra contract in order to have society function. Yes. And and every really, I mean, every society has its own contract. It's the way this is this is how I can maneuver and behave and expect others to maneuver and behave. In this society, in the social contract in North Korea, it's going to be different than in the UK. It's going to be different than Venezuela. It's going to be, which kind of goes back to that culture stack idea that I talked about. The social contract is basically the ingredients are the moral, the political, the economic, and then the cultural. That's those are the elements of the social contract. And so, the social contract that we're under, we see Locke starting to articulate. And if we were to continue with um, with the letter concerning toleration, he said, "I esteem it above." All uh, I esteem it above all things necessary to distinguish exactly the business of civil government from that of religion and to settle the just bounds that lie between the one and the other. So render under Caesar, render under God. If this cannot be done, there is no end put to the controversies, to the controversies that will always be arising between those that have, or at least pretend to have on one side, a con concernment for the interest of men's souls, and on the other side, a care for the commonwealth. So this is the whole idea of separation of church and state, of we need to have the government be in charge of certain things, and and religion is in charge of other things. And, and I put um, Tom Holland here, um, who's an author. He wrote a book called Dominion. Uh, difficult book, but but very 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 powerful. But it traces the impact of Christian of Christian of the Christian Christianity move the movement of Christianity throughout history and what impact it's had on society, and he makes the point that the the very idea of separation of church and state is a religious idea. It comes straight out of Christianity. The idea that you that you would want to keep them separate. Render unto Caesar. What is Caesar's? Yeah. Render unto God. Is that? Yeah, ex exactly right. And if you look at if you look if you go back and look at the the picture of all those men, they didn't separate church and state. No. They were church and state. They, you know, go so ahead. So I'm happy to thought about this. That's a new thought. So forgive me if it's not correct or relevant. It's just after talking about high stakes and low stakes, one that I'm having about the separation of church and state, one reason it's so important is because it does separate the highest stakes from the less high stakes, because really religion is the highest stakes for most people. Those are why those are the um, essential rights, right? The first, the article, I mean, the not the articles of faith, the, the um, help me, the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights, right? 
those are the essential rights because those are things that people will die for. They will die for their faith. And we don't want government to be at that high of stakes where people will battle to the death or give their life. I mean, ideally, we wouldn't battle to the death for religion, but alas, we see that happen. So it seems like it's a way to remove some of the pressure of government because yeah. it, does, does that make sense to you? It's a way to make it less high stakes so that we can have these conversations in government where in some ways it matters more. If I have religious authority over you, boy, do I have complete power over you. If I have religious authority and governmental authority, when it's government, that should be about like, how are we going to fix the roads? And how are we going, you know, like those things that matter a lot less than what does God, God is going to damn you to hell because now I'm in power and I could even have you killed because you're a heretic. Does that yeah, make sense? It, yeah, it, it places, that's a really good insight because it places that which we all in, you know see inside our minds as the highest stakes in the low stakes environment because we know that we can discuss and have conversations about religion knowing that no one's going to force us. So it's yeah, high stakes gonna, content yeah. in a low stakes environment, whereas government, which has force, is the lower stakes stuff, but in a, in a higher stakes The high stakes content. But yeah, yeah, because in government, we can exert control over one another. You know, there is control exerted over us, but it's not about things that we hold as sacred as we do about religion. It's just about our well-being and what's the, what's the best thing for me to happen, you, you know, well, like... Or, or in their mind, it was just life, liberty, and property. So, which, which is high stakes. Yeah. It's just that. It's just that. Right. Everything else is in the low stake, the low stake space. And Tom Holland, yeah. he brought up this great insight that it was Christianity that 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 created this idea of religio and seculum. Religio is that which is eternal, which goes to the wisdom idea from Aristotle, and that which is within one lifetime, seculum. Within one lifetime. Temporal, yeah. Temporal, mm -hmm. which is where we get secular. So the whole idea of a secular society is from Christianity. It's you divide, you take away, you take the religious, and you say, and you say the secular is is all of those things that are, you know, with within one generation. And you and so you you can separate them that way. And you you would only ever have things of the secular in in government. In government, because Except government is the government is a purely secular power structure. It's a purely secular institution, right? And I think the thing that's interesting is the assumption built into that is that both were necessary. It just works better when we separate them. It doesn't mean that we only need the secular because as we're seeing happen, as all of the atheists are seeing happen, which is why they're less bullish on their atheism as we discussed, is they've seen that when we have only the secular and we get rid of the religious, the secular becomes the religious. And yes. people hold those secular views in that higher, in that more sacred um, yes. fight to the death religious pl place in their yes. mind. Yes. Okay. It's and, and that's, I hope that's coming across to people. I'm so glad that you condensed it that way, summarized it, that if you want to have an idea of a separation of church and state, you have to have, it's Christianity that came up with that. If you move away from a Christian foundation, you lose the separation of church and state and they re remerge because it's Christianity that says, oh, force is only for life, liberty, and property. Everything else must be persuasion. So religion is all the, pers all the persuasion. The state is just the force on these little things. Um, and so we just use persuasion on everything except for those few things. If you get rid of Christianity, like you said, they, 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 they're, they're like magnets that want to come. Power wants to come yeah. back. Together. Like the ring wants to be found, you know, it wants yes. to return to its master, you know? Um, yep. and if, I, I want to add in there that I think that Christianity is the foundation, but obviously Christianity itself isn't enough. Like we did have the Christian tyrants, right? Through the, yes. the, the kings. And the, it's, the, it's how the enlightenment thinkers used Christianity. It's what they gained from Christianity and how, and the inspiration God gave to them to understand it in more profound ways and build upon it and explain it in ways that could shape society. So I would say that um, I don't know that everyone has to be Christian in order to have the, the beautiful, the great society we have. But everyone has to have almost reverence, if not for Christianity, then for the views of the Enlightenment, which is inseparable from Christianity. The yes. Enlightenment thinkers were Christian. Yes. And so we can't just go, we need the Enlightenment and not Christianity. That's illogical. That's like saying we need the ocean, but not the water. You can't have it, right? Yes. Yes. And so at least embrace the Enlightenment thinkers and have 
the the um, respect to understand that their brilliant ideas did grow out of their foundation of Christianity. And so anyway, and so it is good to recognize that anyway, I, I will say, though, I completely agree with John Adams that America was made only for a moral and religious pe people and is wholly inadequate to the government of any other, right? Yeah. Because if we remove all of the belief and the faith for the people who aren't going to get into the Enlightenment thinkers, we we shoot ourselves in the foot. We cannot have a secular society because the secular becomes religious. And then we have the worst form of yeah. church and state combined because it's a, it's a corrupted awful, despicable type of religion that's not founded in anything. Like the teachings of Christ are the best thing to have a society founded in. If we're at least striving to follow the example of Christ, there's nothing better. So anyway, and, and that was my little to, diatribe too. Be more yes, inclusive. And it, <laughs> yes. And, and well, yes. And it has to be kept within the bounds that um, Locke said, where it has to be persuasion. You, the, you know, the, the yeah. problem with the, the tyrannical Christian rulers was that they weren't following Locke. They were before Locke usually, but they, yes, they, they, right. thought they, they thought that they could use force on the heart of man, that they could force the divine right of Kings. Divine I'm a right Christian. And I, yeah, like the enlightenment thinkers moved Christianity way forward to say that is not Christianity. Yes. This is. Yes, yeah. exactly. And so it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Hope that hope that made sense to people because that's a that's a crucial idea that, that that separation is really only possible within a Christian environment. That doesn't mean that everyone ha that everyone will be a Christian, but that's why it's so important to make known unto the children of men those ideas. Because if you get enough people who are just cultural Christians like Dawkins said he is, it's like I'm a cultural Christian, I love Christian Christmas music. He likes the benefits of the separation. But can that pers will it will it perpetuate itself? Will a society perpetuate itself if the people themselves don't have Christianity in their heart? In you know in mm -hmm. you know in terms of majority. And I will right. say it's so easy to take it for granted. I know I keep harping on this, but so many people when they um, leave the church and then leave God become atheists. And I've heard it, I've heard it from at least half a dozen people personally that are like, it's not like I'm going to start cheating in my marriage. It's not like I'm going to go murder people. And I'm like because you were brought up in a Christian society and you were brought up in that social contract yes. and according to that morality. So you automatically, you have the axiomatic assumption that those things are wrong. Give it a little while. And Give all of a sudden, while. right, we don't even have to look very far to see what happens to a recently Christian society that now decides, I mean, that, that it wants to build a better society. And oh, guess what? All of those kinds of people don't fit into our better society. We can't make it work for them. So we need yeah. to get rid of them. We see genocide after genocide after genocide happening from post-Christian societies who want to create a better world. In fact, like there's now a, um, I, not now, it's not new, but I became aware of it more within the last couple of years that there is a, um, oh, what's it called? Well, I, darn it, I won't be able to think of it, but it's a Mormon it's a Mormon movement in transhumanism, the, the humanism. There's a Mormon transhumanism movement. And it makes me, I read through all of their mater materials and they seem like really great people. But I'm like, look at what your highest goal is. Your highest goal is this new society. You want to create Zion through the perfection of people, right? Your version of Zion, this Zion. But what happens to all of the people who aren't perfectible in the ways that you see? That is terrifying if that's at the heart of your um, of your philosophy rather than at the heart of your philosophy is the unique, inestimable value of every human life, which is what Christianity alone uniquely gives us. Yeah, yeah. And and this and which built us right into the next. The, and this is the last slide for Locke. All the life and power of true religion consists in the inward and full persuasion of the mind. So it can't be forced. So whatever whatever they're trying to do in that community, it's like, how are you getting people to that 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 state that you want them to be? Is it through persuasion or is it through some other some other means? It is one thing to persuade, another to command. One thing to press with arguments, another with penalties. <clears throat> you know, you've seen, you've been, you've had that. Play to, That's know. exactly what I'm saying to Brian Hills. Come and yeah. talk to me about the arguments. Stop with the penalties. Not stop yeah. with the penalties. Every man mm -hmm. has commission to admonish, exhort, convince another of error, and by reasoning to draw him into truth, but to give laws, receive obedience, and compel with the sword belongs to none but the magistrate. And I would add parenthetically that the only thing the magistrate can do is life, liberty, and property, which is in his other work, second, uh, the second treatise on government. So here's here's... <clears throat> 
everyone has a religion. Everyone has a basis. Like people, so you know, they they rail on religious people. It's like, no, everyone has a religion. And if you look at the definition, maybe the way to say that is that everyone has things that they hold sacred. Yes. Maybe that's a way to say it. Axiomatic. That, okay. They hold it. Yeah, yeah. Axiomatic. And I and I get this from the definition of religion that the U that the U.S. government uses, the EEOC, uh, when they're trying when they're trying to adjudicate issues like in in the workplace of you when know, what is a religion when someone's when they're if there's a, a conflict over a, of a religion in a workplace, what do they use as the as the um, the de definition Measure. of religion? Yeah. Religious beliefs include theistic beliefs as well as non-theistic moral or ethical beliefs as what is right and wrong, which are sincere, sincerely held with the strength of traditional religious views. Everyone has that, whether it's based on religion or on theism or not. And that that came from, so that was that was from a, I'm trying to remember the name of the gentleman, but he, he wrote in the Cornell Law Review, and that's where they adopted, the, 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 the EEOC adopted it from him. He further wrote that religion can be defined as a comprehensive belief system that addresses the fundamental questions of human existence, such as the meaning of life and death, man's role in the universe, and the nature of God and evil. And that gives rise good to duties uh -huh. of conscience. Yeah, good and evil. And that gives rise to duties of conscience. <clears throat> and so the whole idea Perfect. of separation of, of church and state, when people say, I want the law to be this, they're appealing, they're usually appealing to their those axiomatic beliefs, those religious beliefs, their, their worldview. So realizing that everyone has one of those, whatever you want to call it, worldview, um, viewpoint, um, religion, it's it's all the same. It, it kind this of, measure of good and evil, right? Yeah, measure of good measure and evil. Of evil. Is it yes. evil to use a plastic straw? That's where we've gotten to yes. in a lot of conversations. Yes, exactly. It's like that's Is part it of the evil religion. to eat meat? Yeah, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. and you know, if you look at those people as morally lacking because they are doing things that you disapprove of, then you know that's in the religious realm. It's in the for religious you. realm. Yes, exactly. So the the so classic liberalism is the operating that this is is what embodies all of those Enlightenment, Judeo Christian, Greek teleology, all of those ideas. It, so classical liberalism is the social contract that we started with. We're, we're not, we don't have it anymore, but it's what we started with. And it came from, so Liber, liberalism, Liber is, it's got two meanings. Library. It's library. It's, it's, it's the inner bark of plants. It was used back in the day as the, so the free, free people could write contracts and they wrote it on, you know, tree bark or, or, or derivatives of, of plant, of woody plants. And so it became, li the Liber became those who were free compared to those who were slaves. And the derivatives mm. of those words are libro, book, library, liberty, liberate, liberal, and libertine, which is like the exact opposite, those who want complete freedom without restraint. So classic liberalism really is, it's saying, it's basically saying, I'm not God, you're not God. We're not going to arrive at the perfect because we have, have such a hard time discerning it. So it's a mechanism for conflict resolution. It's the operating system for a free society. That's what classic liberalism is. So you have to, you wrestle it out in the legislature or whatever. You wrestle it out with your neighbors. I want this, you know, the school board. I want, you know, this with, you know, so you're wrestling things out and you, it's a mechanism for conflict re resolution, which is what we're talking about today. Conflict resolution. How do you disagree agreeably? Yeah. We should be appealing to these ideals of classic liberalism because that, that's the whole point of it is in, how do imperfect people get along with with the pen instead of resorting to the sword? Yeah, um, I love that. I love that library word because it is like like recognizing liberty and library go together. It's kind of an an acknowledgement that I sh that uh, it's it's a it's a re refusal of power. I'm not going to yes. exert power over you. I'm going to make contracts with you. I'm going to engage with you as an equal and yes. by the according to the rule of law that should be as influenced as possible by the the acquisition of knowledge and understanding and wisdom. That's kind of yes. what it's saying, right? It's exactly right. Yeah. And it, it's okay. often confusing for people because the term liberal was basically taken over or appropriated yeah. by progressivism in the early and 20th century. Liberal or conservative, yeah. Yeah, and so progressivism is actually quite different because it, it says, mm -hmm. you no, know, we do use power of government. We don't just use persuasion. We use power them. of government to do all of these things that we think are good. And so so that there's there's an, there's a... This a, is classical liberalism, which is very different. Classic. It's the ideas it's of our foundation, not a political left yeah. or right. Yeah, yes. okay. And so a lot of people are like, what? Liberalism It's like liberal. It's like, no, no, no know that the word changed over time, but you, it's good to know the or the origin of it. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the bad news is that truth is it's, um, I, I put elusive, expensive and ethereal in this way. Um, 
Truth is difficult to discern. It requires strict rules and hard work to perceive. You've got to have, you know, you've got to follow rational argument. You've got to follow empirical, you know, the, the, the scientific method. Um, the pursuit of truth creates a world of complexity. So you get, to, you, you understand your world less and less as it becomes more and more complex. So, you know, like you said, instead of being able to just do everything yourself, you don't actually know how to do it. If, if you had to make your own anything. toilet paper, if you, anything, you're, you're in a world of hurt. But as long as it's functioning properly, you get the benefit of it all. You know, eye pencil, really good example. Truth is expensive. It takes time and thought to identify and articulate. It's hard work. Most of us are, are busy raising families, being experts in our own tiny little domain, our own occupations. The energy outlay, outlay to challenge experts in other fields is significant, which is why you often hear people say, don't challenge the experts. I'm going to trust the experts. So like, we do need to challenge the experts. The problem is that they're also fallible. And so we, ha we have to be able to negotiate. And corruptible. And, and, and mm -hmm. corruptible, yes. Um, it's also personally expensive, emotionally. And like you said, yeah. if it challenges our assumptions and makes us like, like there is risk to the engagement of truth because some of your axiomatic things that you hold and that you've built your understanding of the world on may be challenged. And that can be an expensive, you know, it's, that's a difficult, um, that's a steep mountain to climb. You need to climb it because you're better off when you're at the top of the mountain, but, it, but it's expensive. Yeah, it's, it's much easier in the short term to just say, I'm going to leave all that to other people. I'm going to do the minimum that I have to do, which often is very honorable, raising a family, a profession, working in the mm -hmm. church. But gosh, the thing, you know, it's it's so, it's like I have this precious um, leisure time available to me. I want to do it, use it doing the things that I want to do. I don't want to go challenge some major, you know, position, you know. Um, I don't want to listen to a two-hour podcast. I get it. However... <laughs> Um, it's gotten easier and easier. I have like my whole motherhood. I was so thankful that I could go to the library and get audiobooks because I read my entire life, even though I have 13 children, right? Which yeah. you wouldn't have time for that. And the other thing is that it, even if you're like, I'm, I'm not going to climb up that mountain right now, please, at the very least, don't yes. throw rocks at the people who do. Don't try to tear them down. Don't say you can't be in our club because you're trying you're you're busily engaged in the pursuit of truth and you're finding conclusions that make us uncomfortable as yes. we refuse to engage in that pursuit of truth, right? Yes. So don't and, and then also don't dissuade others from doing it saying that's dangerous. Don't go up there. You'll be different than we are. That's right out of Isaiah. They enter not themselves nor allow others to enter. Like it's fine to not be engaging in these topics as long as you're not condemning and criticizing those who are and telling others not to engage. That's when it becomes much more problematic. Yes. And, and I would add that there are seasons of life. It's like when we, when our children are young and I was building my career or what have you, when you have babies, it's like, it's very, it's like, the, it's very likely that the only thing you can do is you're just, you're like, you're just barely surviving day to day. It's when you get into. Yeah, I will say I'm going to push back because really, I mean, how many books did I read at 2 a.m. almost asleep oh. nursing babies, right? Like, like it's just a choice every minute, every minute. It's a choice. And sometimes my brain is, is, is just done. It's exhausted. Yeah. But that's because it's been working so hard and you can start again. And so I encourage that. Like, I think that the you every mom, no matter how tired, and dad, no matter how tired, can watch a movie, and they do, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of what you value what you and what you choose to value. And so, yeah. and we're preaching to the choir with people listening to this podcast because they're obviously engaged in the pursuit of truth. But yeah, yeah you, you, I mean, no one has to run faster than they have strength, but it's also just a question of what you choose, and yeah. because we all, we all have infinitely more leisure time than our ancestors yes, did at sure. every stage of life. We For all sure. are in the car at some point. We're all, you know, doing dishes at some point or something. Where... And they were attending church lectures for like hours and hours and hours on end. They'd yeah. come to lunch and come back. I mean, so, yeah, I don't know that we have a whole lot of excuse. That's true. Um, so we're still in the 30,000 foot view of understanding truth, understanding the social contract, understanding what, what are all the pieces that we have, that were handed to us by prior generations that we need to understand so we can properly engage in conversation. Another piece that's crucial is what uh, Mark Twain said, a lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth can get its book, its boots on. So falsehood flies, truth limps. So if you, if you introduce a lie intentionally or otherwise, you, you just bogged everything down. You know, you, yeah. when, when we, when we're in a place, go ahead. Well, can I again respond? Cause I feel this so much. It is in this, in the, in the topic I'm engaged in, it is so easy to rattle off all of these things about Joseph Smith's polygamy. 
And then in order to explain them, I have to go, okay, well, let's look yes. at this source and let's look at this source and let's talk about the context of this and let's put that scripture in context. And, you know, it is, I'm like, can I figure out how to tie my boots on faster because yeah. this lie is flying around the world and the people just don't have the interest or the patience because they, because they're also, they're also um, ideologically determined to see it the way they see it. Either Joseph is a bad guy or Joseph is a polygamist so that there's no, there's no struggle in their, their perspective in the church. Right. So anyway, I just wanted to say, I like, I'm sure all of us in this feel that so much because I can hear people rattle things off. And I'm like, okay, let's take those one at a time. Or even my recent engagement with Bill Real, where he was like, even if it's only eight deeds, you can't explain those eight deeds. I'm like, I just explained another 20 deeds and, and I can, let's get it. Do you have the patience to get into those eight deeds? And ah, it's exhausting. Yeah. yeah, yeah so the articulate hard discovery, reality. Yeah. It, it, and that's why I put it under the bad news category because the, the, um, the ability, the, the 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 pursuit of and articulation of truth is orders of magnitude more difficult than the than the giving of a lie, than spreading so, a lie, yeah, and spreading a lie. Mm -hmm. And so, a society that's plagued with lies and liars, it just completely bogs down. In whatever domain those lies exist, that thing will completely bog down. Whether it's a plane come or a, a door falling off of a plane because someone in there was lying on the quality assurance or whatever it is. When mm -hmm. lies, as soon as lies start to, it, it bogs down that society. It's, well, it's look, crazy. look how quickly we, we, everyone knew everything for sure in 2020 and 2021. And you were silenced. If you said something different, if yeah. you said maybe a lab, you were silenced. If you said, you know what I mean? All of these things. Whereas look at how, how much excruciating effort we're having to go through in science and in um, government procedure to try to overcome those obvious lies. It's very, it's very, I'm just seeing it everywhere. What you're talking about. It's so easy to spread a lie and it's really hard to correct it with the and, truth. And sometimes only time will tell. It's like, you have to wait for time. It's like the lie is instant. Now you get the evidence. Yeah. To get the evidence to, to, for the, for the, the yeah for the evidence to like come into being um you know for for people to get experience with the thing um also we resist truth is ethereal we resist it you know where we're all living in plato's cave you know we're down there we're seeing the shadows and like the shadows are my world and i like, don't change my world and there's a person saying there's light out there you know and and i've seen drawings where it's like multiple iterations of the cave there's you know you get from one cavern into the, you know, to next, the next cave the next i think chamber. that's our whole life yeah <laughs> yeah and you know people only change their minds from a place of physical and psychological safety so if we are challenging their identity if we are harping on that the psychological safety is gone people are knocking they're just like Doom. The, the, the door closes and it's, we're just shouting words past each other. Um, identity level beliefs are the most difficult to change, which is why discussions around morality and religion politics are so difficult. That's why it's at the black belt layer, you know, in the, in the book. Um, as soon as we're talking about an idea that makes someone believe that they are a good person, the difficulty of changing their mind increases significantly. I'm a good person because I believe this. Um, Jonathan Haidt wrote The Religious Mind. He said that morality both bi b b binds and blinds. Morality both binds and blinds. There's an, oh, it, blinds. It, okay. Blinds. I yeah, got it. Okay. L. Binds and blinds. And that's, I don't know, we could have, talk about that probably for a long time. Yeah. Everyone has a morality. Every political system is built on religious beliefs or a worldview. This is inescapable. You know, Except you know, that this is like this is the water that we're swimming in, you know, that every system is based on some sort of worldview or religious view. Um, how do we navigate within that space and be persuasive instead of be, you know, being coercive? Now, the good news is that humans, again, this is the human, you know, every line through, through the human heart. Humans are consistent, compassionate and, and crave connection. Deep down, we all want very similar things. I would say we want the same thing. We want happiness for ourselves, our loved ones, and everyone else. In that order, it's the Enos progression. The best way to achieve happiness for ourselves are systems that are conducive to the happiness of everyone, which is why I brought up Aristotle last time. Otherwise, you're discussing a system of power, a system of power, and the likelihood that you're going to be the most powerful is extremely small. So aim for and help perpetuate the system that is most likely to give um, happiness to everyone. 
Um, Plato wrote in the, in the Socratic dialogues that rarely do people believe or do evil things. Almost always the case is that they are missing information, which if they had, they wouldn't do or believe that thing. But it's not usually just one little single factor data point. It's often a worldview or some, there's a, like, there's a lot there, but they're, 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 most people are not evil is what Plato was saying. Most people are not evil. And yet we often treat them like we immediately accuse them of, of evil, of apostasy, of heresy, um, which again, attacks their identity and it shuts conversation down. Um, it brings out the lizard brain, right? You're attacking me. You're attacking my identity, who I am. Um, it's kind of like, oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go past that. The <clears throat> people love to be listened to. They want connection. People crave that. They want to be understood, which means the good news is there's always a starting place for a, a, a conversation or a relationship if you will listen. If you'll listen, there's always, because people crave to be listened to. So what are the rules for, um, what are the rules of engagement? Given all of that, well, now we're coming back kind of down from the 30,000 foot view. Given all of that background of this is the water that was swimming in that I didn't learn until grad school. Maybe other people picked it up sooner, but you know, it's not part of the curriculum. And I, I looked at the state standards in the state that I live in. It's not part of the curriculum. Um, it's like the, so, so that's why I gave it here. What now we're getting into? How do we have these kinds of conversations? Oh, there I are, like it. Okay, and I wanted to add one thing. Sorry, just in your oh, in your good and bad. I mean, your good news and bad news. Um, one thing that I just kept thinking also while we talked about how fast lies spread and how slow truth spread spreads. The good thing is though, lies are a cheetah, right? They they spread fast, but they lose the long term game every single time, and that's another thing that's worth recognizing. It's a lot of work to spread the truth, but it always wins. It's the tortoise, right? The True. the lie is the hare, but the truth is the tortoise, and it always wins in the end. Truth so that's another out. point. Yeah, truth mm -hmm. will always out. Yeah, great point. Um, <clears throat> so understand that there are venue specific rules for engagement. So for example, we talked about um, the committee of the whole already. They said with it, you know, in this space, we're going to engage in this way with these stakes. In this space, we got these stakes. Congress has standing rules, precedent, special rules of procedure that they agree on. Say we, we bind ourselves to this way of interacting. Courts have procedural okay. law. You can say objection, you know, overrule. It's like they, you can't just say whatever you want. There's, there's, it, there's an infrastructure. There's a, there are rules sure. governing how you interact. Local governments use, um, and associations use Robert's rules of order, which is like 600 pages. So it's, I mean, it's complicated to create the rules of right. engagement. But we all, in any venue, there are the rules of engagement, right? Every, like, yeah. Formal debates have them with this much time. You've got rebuttals. Um, even, you know, I'm a tech guy. So computer applications and browser tabs, if nowadays, if a, one tab goes rogue, the computer will tell you, do you want to shut down this one tab? I won't crash the whole system. Just this one conversation that's taking place. So that, that same idea that we, that we need to be doing, you know, if we have one thing we disagree with, with a loved one or a neighbor, it shouldn't crash the whole relationship. So it kind of oh, okay. is, is what I mean by that. Okay. Um, can, which is means we have to hold that discussion in a separate space from my relationship with you is contingent on this conversation that I'm having with you right now. That's a, that's a problem. That's a crash the whole system type of a conversation. Yeah. Okay. And in civil discourse, we don't want to have that. So, but that's often where we are. As soon as someone disagrees on abortion or on climate change or whatever, it's like, oh, you, you immediately split and you can't talk to that person. Um, a good example of this, if you ever, if those who haven't seen this, go look it up. Kathy Newman's 2018 interview with Jordan Peterson. He talked about, so he was interviewed after the interview by someone else who said, how did you do what you did? And he said, so the thing is, is that Jordan Peterson is a professional, professional listener. He's a clinical psychologist. So he has spent tens of thousands of hours over the course of his career listening and having difficult conversations with people in real trouble. And so he, he is familiar with the different mindsets that people can get into. And so he's able, when he's listening, he's not just listening. He's actually able to like, separate himself from the conversation and say, what kind of spirit is animating the person that is talking to me at the moment? And he's actually able to watch both at the same time. He's able to watch what the person is saying and then be able to formulate a, a response, but also think about the way the person is thinking 
And he said, that's what I did in this conversation. It's like, I recognized when she stepped out of the green room and the camera light went on, she turned into a different person and started coming at me from this religious standpoint, I would say. And he was able to separate himself and like, watch what was happening. And it's just, it's an, it's an incredible. Uh, uh, yeah. And I'm so, I, I've thought about since with some, like with my recent discussion with Bill Real. After the fact, I often realize what people are doing or the game they're playing. And I'm trying to get better at, in the course of the conversation, being able to recognize oh, this what game on. are you playing? Because you're playing a game. You're not. And that's exactly what he was talking about here. So that's a skill I'm still working yes. on because I don't expect that. You don't expect people to be playing a game when you're just coming to the, unless, unless you're also a game player, right? Yeah. And yeah. So, so that's a good skill to gain. And, you know, and in, in his in his defense, or in, the, in all of our defenses, who can't do what he did, it's like she stepped into his space, the space that yeah. he was that he had spent his whole career in. She stepped into that, and that's why he was able to just. It's like, oh, you're you're now playing my game, you know. And and we don't right. all. Play I'm, glad you, all the time. I'm glad you brought it up right now because it, being aware of it makes it so you can possibly do better. Like I'm yes. hoping that in the future I can recognize more quickly when someone is using a tactic or playing a game or doing something that's like, I know you're smart enough to understand what I'm saying. So why are you pretending that you're not? You yeah. don't, you know, those kinds of tactics to be yeah. able to at least recognize them can help you respond better. Yeah. And and yes, exactly. And, and, and this is as much an invitation, really, like, like you just said to all of us that when we also find ourselves re reacting in a space of conflict, to step back and say, what's happening here? How yeah, be able to observe it. Be an observer. Observe ourselves and say, okay, lizard brain, I'm going to turn you off and I'm going to reload all of these ideas about the social contract and persuasion and tolerance and all the rules of engagement, and which takes enormous amounts of practice. And I'm going to be a better dialoguer, conversationalist partner with you. Uh, that's kind of the hope. That's why I brought him up. It's like, be like him and don't just go lizard brain, but be able to step back and 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 load load the program into your brain this is how i need to respond um agreement so a few thoughts about civil discourse agreement is life in the fast lane when you agree with people like agree on the rules of the road you're able to go you don't have to think about how you, you know it's just automatic as soon as someone stops obeying the life the, the the rules of the road everything slows down if some pedestrian goes and stands in the middle of the intersection everything comes to a stop to a halt and that's kind of like disagreement disagreement is not life in the fast lane it is the mechanic shop you have to slow down so often i this happens to me i like i want to continue at the same pace of yeah of, of convince convincing as i do when i'm talking to people i agree with it's like no you got to slow down go socratic ask questions a defensive posture Listen. is bad. yeah if, if you're putting someone in defensive posture you're doing it wrong and yet that's almost yeah. what we always do Wisdom, or if begins, you're getting into defensive posture, both of them yes, don't put yes, someone in it and don't ways. get into it yourself. Mm -hmm. Both ways, wisdom begins in wonder. If you are not, if if you're putting someone in a defensive posture, they're not going to be wondering, and wisdom's not going to come. So, how okay. do you in, a, in an open minded position where you're not a threat to me? I so I can wonder about what we're talking about practice versus malpractice. We've talked about that before, and the idea of whoop, the idea that. Um, some, someone said to me when I was having a discussion about polygamy online the other day, and I, I said, that was ad hominem. And they're like, yeah, but ad hominem is not a sin, so it's okay. And I'm like, ad hominem? It's like, no, Jesus didn't say, you know, don't commit ad hominem, but you're missing the mark. It's, it's a sin in the sense of the Greek word for sin, which is to miss the mark. When you when you attack someone personally, you are not attacking the argument. Your arrow is flying at the person. Instead of the idea, you're missing the mark. In that sense, it is a sin. So avoid sin avoid the wrong mark target the idea um, or really what you wanted to target is the person in the sense of make them trust you or or do things that in a positive way in a positive way yeah we talked yep, about and this. i do want to clarify one thing just because yeah. i um it's not that i'm feeling defensive i want to clarify something about ad hominem disagreeing with a person and even calling out a person for lying and showing the evidence is not an ad hominem attack an ad hominem yeah. attack is is insulting them something an immutable characteristic or some characteristic about them right yes. or or attributing motive to them which is different than even say poking fun at them in a way to make it entertaining so people will tune in while they while you expose that they are lying about something 
So when people are making funny videos about Anthony Fauci or when they are playing videos showing what he said here and what he said there, that's not an ad hominem attack. That's just trying to expose the dishonesty and the narrative they push. So I wanted to clarify that too. It has it has to be backed up, right? It has to be backed up with by evidence. You have to show it. You Mm -hmm. have to show it. Like this is a description, and here's the evidence to back the description. Right, and it's not, and it's not getting into the personal. You know, you're not like you can poke fun at someone without doing an ad hominem attack because you're poking fun of the dis the difference in their narrative versus the truth. Yeah, and you know, in in my, I think you know. Often it would probably be better to say, that's not true. Rather than saying, you're a liar, it's, that's not true. That idea right there is not true. That, that, that might be a way to, you know, to change. Yeah, but there's the also a time when people need to be held accountable, right? Like, like I, for me, Anthony Fauci is a good example of that. I think it's really good to have the videos showing what he said and then what he said and yeah. then what we know. You know, you see those yeah. videos going around on platforms where they're allowed. I think yeah. those are valuable. Yeah. Uh, to me, to me, it's DNC 121 again. The, it has this big long list, which I'll show here in a minute, of here's the way you're supposed to interact. And there is one clause for reproving both times with sharpness, but you have to do it with right. an increase of love. And I don't know how you do that if you're not showing this is the evidence for why I'm calling you that. This is actually right. how you're behaving, right? So that, and, right. And, and, I, and I still want to have a relationship with you, um, but I need to have a relationship with the person who's trustworthy. Right. Um, it has to absolutely be backed up with evidence. Yep. I agree. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. Yep. We talked about this before. I'll let people go back to the last video if they want to. You've got to understand the right way and the wrong way to use evidence, to use reason, to use revelation. When people come at you and say, I have received personal revelation that polygamy, for example, is of God, that has no bearing on me. Just like my, my, if I have a, the revelation has to be, is to the individual. If you, it's, it's, it, it cannot be shared unless God has shared it with both people, if that makes sense. You can't use your revelation you've received as an argument against someone else. No. You, you, no. That's not a valid use of that epistemology. It's valid. It makes you. me crazy when people say, as a Christian, I know, like they, they use their identity as a Christian in order to convince a non-Christian of something. Yeah. How is that useful at all? Yeah. Yeah, revelate because mm-hmm. they're a Christian because they've if they've had you know God reveal to them or you know Christ reveal themselves himself to them in in some way, but that's or they were raised that way. Sometimes they were raised that way. Yeah, they were raised that way. I'm hoping that they've you know yeah. received Christ, but um, yeah, you can't that that would be a malpractice of rev, of revel of revelation of inspiration to say you yeah. have to be because I received this. So, God uh, told me, therefore, yeah. God, well, God told me, therefore, you, yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to, so when you're having conversations with people, recognize, you know, Dunning-Kruger effect, which is the idea of um, most people, when they know little, think they know a lot. And it's only as you get to know more that you that you realize, oh my gosh, I don't know as much as I thought I did. So that's rampant. And recognize and be graceful with people and engage in a way that can help that come out without damaging the relationship. Another way of Kruger is the peak of Mr. Sh- of Mount Stupid, Versus, you know, the slope of enlightenment, the valley of despair of like, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. I don't know. Like when I first had the realization, like, oh my gosh, this whole polygamy thing, I think it's true. That was a valley of despair for me. You know, it's like, yeah. Oh and, the, and the rest of it was trying to make it up what I think is the slope of enlightenment of I have to relearn and question a number of things. We talked about that last time, so I won't go into it too yeah. much more. But the um, idea that who is it that said a little knowledge is a dangerous thing? Yeah, that's right? it, right? Because- There's the danger. Mount stupid. Yeah, it comes with certainty because you don't know enough yet to recognize the complexity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I like this particular version because it shows there's actually a confidence gap. The expert is actually less confidence, confident than the ignorant person. <laughs> yeah. So that, you know, recognize that that's going on too. So recognize it for yourself and also recognize that you'll see it in other people and be graceful, be gracious about it. Um, so la- this is the kind of the last segment here is we, we talked about how to have impossible conversations and I'm not going to dig into each one of these. I just want to show them to, to I want to show the 34 steps. I'm just going to kind of pop through the slides just to show how much work this is. This is a big deal. How to learn to have impossible conversations. This is not like, Oh, I watched the two hour video with Gary and Michelle. And now I know how to do it all. It's like, no, this is actually like a course of learning. That's going to take time. Um, and I recommend getting, but you can start implementing and practicing right now, right? We can always be strong. All of us can always be striving to do better from where we are. Yeah. Yes. I guess my point is you don't have to master all of the principles of healthy nutrition to know, to cut back sugar. Right. (laughs) So, yes. And I guess I'm I'm bringing this up as like a, from a point of humility to recognize 
there's a you know, to become an expert piano player or or whatever. There's a there's a long way to there's a long road to yeah. travel. We're gonna make mistakes. We're gonna make mistakes, mm -hmm. and there's it's actually awesome that there's skills to learn and a, because what you can create at the end is beautiful like it is with a violinist yeah. or a pianist what you can create at the end is beautiful what you may create at the beginning may not be quite so beautiful but you know why am i engaging in this conversation what am i trying to achieve be partners not adversaries we talked about that last time where are you both looking are you is the issue the problem or is the person the problem if they need to be the, you know, there needs to be a partnership developing and maintaining a good connection listen more talk less don't don't just deliver your truth don't don't just like, ah, I just, just vomit on the person. Here's all the things. Cause they're, they immediately just shut down, right? People usually have better intentions than you think and be okay walking away. Don't push the conversation partner past the partner point. If you, if you start seeing that this is going beyond partner and into adversarial, it's okay to say, we don't have to solve this today. That's the white belt level, right? That's, that's just the first part. Oh, then they get into, yeah, now, now there's the beginner level. Like, there's, there's certain techniques of making sure you're defining your def, your, your words, focus on a specific question. Don't, don't have the, the conversation go all over the place. If they say, I really had a hard time today. Oh, you had a hard time today. You just repeat back to them what they said and, and let them just keep talking, which will often get them to, you know, where, where that, where they'll recognize the Dunning-Kruger effect for themselves. They'll get to a point where like, oh, maybe I don't know as much about this as that I, as I think I do. Anyway, again, nine points on the beginner level. Uh, intermediate level, there's seven things. And I, I'll just, you know, I'm, again, just po people can read the book, but um, you know, say, create a way for the person to back out with, you know, and save face, which is number two, build golden yeah. bridges. Don't, don't leave them. Don't back them into a corner. Um, yeah. You're not trying to smush them into the ground at all. Not trying yeah. to smush them into the ground. You know, advance. There's five. Admit you're wrong. Admit you were wrong. Admit you were yes. wrong. That's not. Yes, yeah. exactly. So again, getting into, um, you know, advanced level, expert level there's you know this is getting getting into stuff where people have really hard conversations like hostage negotiation you know he, he actually went and studied those people and, and read the transcripts of those conversations like how do you negotiate with somebody who is that extremely far gone in that space and then the final one is the two keys to conversing with ideologues which is the black belt the hardest how do you discuss epistemology how do you speak in other moral dialects so again the point here showing this is this is a this is a lifelong pursuit. Hopefully by seeing those 34, now 36 steps, we see, okay, there's, there's, a, there's things that I can learn. I can be better. I can be a better conversationalist. I can be a better practitioner of this social contract. I can, I can be a partner instead of an adversary. Um, <clears throat> which brings us, you know, the Lord is, can be so much more concise than we. You know, it says no power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood. But really, it's any power or virtue should be maintained only by persuasion, long suffering, gentleness, meekness, love unfeigned, kindness, pure knowledge, without hypocrisy, without guile, um, reproving with times of sharpness when moved upon by the Holy Ghost. You got to make sure that's the motivation, right? And not your lizard brain fighting. Afterwards, showing an increase of love. I've, I've actually had people quote to me, sometimes you have to reprove with sharpness. I'm like, well, where's the increase of love? And they're like, oh. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's got to be present. Let thy bowels be full of charity towards all men. If your charity, if your bowels not full of charity toward the person you're having a conversation with, it's like, I need to recuse myself until I can. I need to stay in a space where I can be in the space of charity. Because if I'm not, it's going to be a pointless conversation. Letting ver and virtue. Yeah. We have a tip. We have a bad tendency in, I think, Christianity and it shows up in Mormonism. It just happened to me the other day where you pray at someone. I'll pray for you, or I, I just love you so much. I want you to be like me, right? Yeah, that's, like that's I just not care about you. Yeah. That's and that's that's not charity. It's like the, we we can we can manipulate all of these things, yeah. In in to you use them in manipulative ways, right? Yeah. So we it's just checking our own hearts and say where yeah. am I actually coming from here? Which takes me back to Aristotle's definition of virtue. Virtue is acting in the right way for the right reason to the right person at the right time in the right amount for the right length. It's like, it's extremely yeah. difficult. Being virtuous in our conversations is extremely difficult and it requires a lifetime of, of effort to try to do it right. Um, and a lot of prayer, a lot of like, like seeking the Lord to know is, am I doing this the right way? And, and then a lot of uncertainty as you go forward, trying your best to do it in the right way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Last slide. Oh, say what is truth. You know, like go reread the, the yeah. that hymn. You know, the the priceless how the the priceless the value of truth will be the the fairest gem. 
You know, the, the proud monarch's costliest diadem is counted but dross and refuse. If you can spend some time thinking about how precious really is truth and how sacred should I handle the space in which I'm dealing or trying to deal with truth with people, hopefully all of this, you know, this is the last slide, hopefully all of this will help us all say, I will restrain, I will be Marquis de Lafayette, I will be, I'm going to do this different. And, and if you want, you know, those who, you know, are watching this, Go watch the last 27 minutes of the last episode that we had because we talked about contention. What does contention do from a scriptural standpoint to us individually? And it really is a continuation of this same conversation. It just brings in the scriptural side and shows how bad contention is. And it just folds so nicely with the idea of classical liberalism of how you have to be tolerant, persuasive, and all of those things. So that's what I wanted to I, share, Michelle. That's what I wanted to share. I love it. And I want to add one thing that I don't remember if I added last time, probably because I always think this way, but along with truth, like the truth that true to the truth that our parents had cherished, true to the faith, that for, true to the truth for which martyrs have perished, right? Yes. We, we want to honor our ancestors. Let's honor their dedication for seeking truth that caused them to join this crazy religion and traipse yeah. all across the country multiple times, right? Yes. As they did. And um, so, so to say, why does this matter? Or we should just put it on the shelf is not the quest for truth, which is what we should value. And along with that, love is the greatest truth. So any truth delivered without love isn't truth it, yeah. because it's in error, right? You cannot have truth unless it's coupled with love to the best of our ability, unless it's with charity. It's, it's not even that someone can't just receive the truth. It's also that it's not the truth, right? Truth yeah. can't be yelled at you very like like the truth is intertwined inseparable with love inseparably with love right there what is it um our our rights are what indivisible right indivisible is what truth and love are they're indivisible one ceases to exist without the other yeah i, I think of like the mirror of air said in in the in the, in the Philosopher's Stone and in, in, in Harry Potter, where he could only get the thing he wanted if he pursued it a certain way, you know, and that's yeah. the same thing about truth. If, if you are trying to pursue truth in the wrong way, the, with the wrong kind of conversation, truth just, it just evaporates. And it evaporates. all of the focus is on the anger and the contention and the divisiveness. And that's where the, the fabric is going ping, 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 ping. The, right. the fabric and that's society. where, honestly, following the Savior's example, he sometimes would give sort of, he would sort of just make fun in a fun way. Like he was not above just kind of knowing it wasn't worth engaging with someone. So he'll just kind of make a joke or a barb. Do you know what I mean? Like sometimes that's better than engaging in the fight when you know, you know, when someone just keeps insulting, insulting me, I'll just do a little like, oh, I hope you feel better now. Have a nice day. Do you know what I mean? Or like, I'm not chocolate. Like that. I'm not chocolate. Yeah. I can't eat everyone, you know. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, I, I did. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I think that that, yeah. that works out well, too, to just find a sort of graceful or humorous way to step aside and let someone do what they're going to do. I like I like thinking I this is what someone who loved to come after me one day. It just popped into my mind. Glenda, the good witch, when she said, be gone, you have no power here. And that's one thing I've started to use too. just I've made a meme of that, but also just mentally like that's a good one to pop up when people are coming at me to just post that and be like, you know, because it's kind of I also have this picture of like just Zen among the sharks and just like, <laughs> okay, it can't affect me if I don't let it, right? That's what I try to do is blend to the good witch. And, you, you know, we can, we do have the ability to do that with enough practice and, and then knowing where our limits are. Cause I also have to recognize, I, I guess I'm making it about me. I'm not meaning to, I just, I am taking a lot of, re, yeah. there are so many personal attacks, so many yes. below the belt comments that are aimed at me and really, really difficult ways, you know? Yeah. So also knowing my limits and knowing when I'm starting to feel like yeah. this is de devastating me. I'm feeling devastated right now because it's, you know, I've just read 50 comments on three different pages. Yeah. And so knowing when to just take a time out, it's fine too. And yeah. like, like I did, people can laugh at me the other day when it got really intense and I was just kneeling down. I was like, Lord, I just need a hug. I just need you to give me a hug because I'm kind of falling apart, you know, because it gets really hard. Yeah. And so, um, so anyway, I think it's, I think it's okay to, anyway, like, I think it's okay to just go to the Lord and, and lay it at, at the Lord's feet 
knowing that the Lord will rejuvenate you and you'll be ready for another interview in a few days. <laughs> Yeah, when I, when I think that the Lord descended below all things, like the things you're talking about are some of the things you have to descend below. It's like, this this is really, this, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's my hope that we can have better conversations, not do this to each other because truth is elusive. It, 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 is, it, just, it just disappears when we engage wrong. When we disagree disagreeably, truth is the first victim. It's the first victim. Yeah. And, when, and we're left there just wrestling in the dark with each other with no actual... No, no, no. We will not move forward. That is a beautiful note to end on, but I'm going to ruin it because I want to end by sharing your dad joke that made me laugh. I gave me a much needed laugh. When Gary messaged me and was talking about doing this, I was like, yes, I want to. I just, I'm, I need some time to recover because I was in this low spot. And so I said something like, I'm just getting hammered and um, I'm just getting hammered on all sides and it's taking a toll. And Gary responded with, I can't remember. I, th I think you said, I hope it's the, I get, I hope it's the can't touch this kind of hammered, which yeah. was <laughs> delightful. It was the best. And so that was the best dad joke of, well, that, of my recent memory. <laughs> so thank you for coming through with that. That was great. So yes, when I'm getting hammered, my, that's my new model. Can't touch this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, that Michelle. Was, thank you so much. Yes, thank you for coming on. And I hope everybody found this to be valuable and instructive. I think it's extremely valuable. I do hope that our side can raise the bar, can really elevate the, the level of discourse. And, you know, if we see someone on our side engaging in ways um, that are um, not productive with the other side, I think there are places to be like in the great apostle beam sharing memes among ourselves, you know, whatever, that's going to happen. That's fine. But when we're engaging in conversations with people who disagree with us, maybe we can, um, I don't know, would it be too annoying or preachy to like post this or like, like this could be a useful tool to let people see how we need to engage if we want to be the most effective that most we possibly can be and gain as many allies as possible. And even if we don't gain allies, we can at least gain the respect of the people who yeah. disagree with us. Yeah. And and I'll just, I'll, I guess I'll say that I speak all of this in an ideal way, just like you spoke, said last time, like, these are ideals. I fall short of it all the time. And for those who are watching and saying, but I saw you like, yes, you did. And I'm so sorry. I want to be better. It's a lifelong pursuit. I better, I better get better at it sooner because, you know, I'm probably on the downhill side. But anyway, yeah, I, I want to be better at this. And I, I will say as. I was, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. As I said in our last conversation, you model this as well as anybody I've ever seen. So, and I think there's a lot of value. Like people look up Gary's comments because it really is helpful to see someone exemplifying it to help us know how we're going to do this. So we'll keep trying. Right. right. Keep now, now the pressure's on, Gary. Now the pressure's on, yeah. Yeah. Everyone let me know if he slips up, if he does something <laughs> you don't know. Tattle told me, I'm the bishop. <laughs> Thank Michelle you so much. It. Thank you. And um, I appreciate it. And we will see you. Oh, the next part of the conversation, this first conversation with Whitney and Jeremy is coming up on Sunday. I thought it was fabulous. We saved the best half of the conversation for last. So join us and much more to come. We'll see you next time. Michelle.